Chapter twenty five of Kings, Queens, and Pawns An American Woman at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Kings, Queens, and Pawns An American Woman at the Front. Chapter twenty five Volunteers and Patriots i hold a strong brief for the english for the english at home restrained earnest determined and unassuming for the english in the field equally all of these things the british army has borne attacks at la basse and ypres positions so strategically difficult to hold that the germans have concentrated their assaults at these points it has borne the horrors of the retreat from mons when what the kaiser called general french's contemptible little army was forced back by oncoming hosts of many times its number it is fought as the english will always fight with unequalled heroism but without heroics to-day after many months of war the british army in the field is as smart in a military sense as tidy if it will forgive me the word as well ordered as efficiently cared for as the german army was in the beginning partly this is due to its splendid equipment mostly it is due to that fetish of the british soldier wherever he may be personal neatness behind the lines he is jaunty cheerful smart beyond belief he hates the trenches not because they are dangerous or monotonous but because it is difficult to take a bath in them he is four days in the trenches and four days out on his days out he drills and marches to get back into condition after the forced inaction of the trenches and he gets his hair trimmed there is something about the appearance of the british soldier in the field that got me by the throat perhaps because they are in a sense my own people speaking my tongue looking at things from a viewpoint that i could understand that partly but it was more than that these men and boys are volunteers the very flower of england they march along the roads heads well up eyes ahead thousands of them what a tragedy for the country that gives them up who will take their places these splendid scots with their picturesque kilts their bare muscular knees their great shoulders the cheery irish swaggering a bit and with a twinkle in their blue eyes these tall young english boys showing race in every line these dashing canadians so impressive that their every appearance on a london street was certain to set the crowds to cheering i saw them in london and later on i saw them at the front still later i saw them again prostrate on the ground in hospital trains on hospital ships i saw mounds too marked with wooden crosses volunteers and patriots a race incapable of a mean thing incapable of a cruelty a race of sportsmen playing this horrible game of war fairly almost too honestly a race not of diplomats but of gentlemen you will always be fools said a captured german naval officer to his english captors and we shall never be gentlemen but they are not fools it is that attitude toward the english that may defeat germany in the end every man in the british army to-day has counted the cost he is there because he elected to be there he is going to stay by until the thing is done or he is he says very little about it he is uncomfortable if any one else says anything about it he is rather matter-of-fact indeed and nonchalant as long as things are being done fairly but there is nothing calm about his attitude when his opponent hits below the belt it was a sense of fair play as well as humanity that made england rise to the call of belgium it is england's sense of fair play that makes her soldiers and sailors go white with fury at the drowning of women and children and non-combatants at the unprincipled employment of such trickery in war as the use of asphyxiating gases or at the insulting and ill-treating of those of their army who have been captured by the germans it is at the english not at the french or the belgians that germany is striking in this war her whole attitude shows it british statesmen knew this from the beginning but the people were slow to believe it 
but escaped prisoners have told that they were discriminated against. I have talked with a British officer who made a sensational escape from a German prison camp. German soldiers have called across to the French trenches that it was the English they were after. In his official order to his troops to advance, the German emperor voiced the general sentiment. It is my royal and imperial command that you concentrate your energies for the immediate present upon one single purpose, and that is that you address all your skill and all the valor of my soldiers to exterminate first the treacherous English and walk over General French's contemptible little army. Headquarters, Aix la Chapelle, August nineteenth, nineteen hundred fourteen. In the name of the dignity of great nations, compare that order with Lord Kitchener's instructions to his troops, given at the same time. You are ordered abroad as a soldier of the king to help our French comrades against the invasion of a common enemy. You have to perform a task which will need your courage, your energy, your patience. Remember that the honor of the British Army depends on your individual conduct. It will be your duty not only to set an example of discipline and perfect steadiness under fire, but also to maintain the most friendly relations with those whom you are helping in this struggle. The operations in which you are engaged will, for the most part, take place in a friendly country, and you can do your own country no better service than in showing yourselves in France and Belgium in the true character of a British soldier. Be invariably courteous, considerate, and kind. Never do anything likely to injure or destroy property, and always look upon looting as a disgraceful act. You are sure to meet with a welcome and to be trusted. Your conduct will justify that welcome and that trust. Your duty cannot be done unless your health is sound. So keep constantly on your guard against any excesses. In this new experience, you may find temptations both in wine and women. You must entirely resist both temptations, and, while treating all women with perfect courtesy, you should avoid any intimacy. Do your duty bravely. Fear God, honor the king. Signed, Kitchener, Field Marshal. End of chapter 25「XXVI of Kings, Queens, and Pawns, An American Woman at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Kings, Queens, and Pawns, An American Woman at the Front. Chapter 26. A Luncheon at British Headquarters. The same high-crowned roads, with pitfalls of mud at each side, the same lines of trees, the same coating of ooze, over which the car slid dangerously, but a new element. Khaki. Khaki everywhere. Uniforms, tents, transports, all of the same hue. Skins, too, where one happens on the Indian troops. It is difficult to tell where their faces end and their yellow turbans begin. Except for the slightly rolling landscape and the khaki, one might have been behind the Belgian or French army. There were, as usual, aeroplanes overhead, clouds of shrapnel smoke, and not far away the thunder of cannonading. After a time, even that ceased, for I was on my way to British General Headquarters, well back from the front. I carried letters from England to Field Marshal Sir John French, to Colonel Brinsley Fitzgerald, aide-de-camp to the chief, as he is called, and to General Huguet, the liaison between the French and English armies. His official title is something entirely different, but the French word is apt. He is the connecting link between the English and French armies. I sent these letters to headquarters and waited in the small hotel for developments. The British antipathy to correspondence was well known. True, there were indications that a certain relaxation was about to take place. Frederick Palmer in London had been notified that before long he would be sent across, and I had heard that some of the London newspapers, the Times and a few others, 
were to be allowed a day at the lines. But at the time my machine drew into that little French town and deposited me in front of a wretched inn, no correspondent had been to the British lines. It was terra incognita. Even London knew very little. It was rumored that such part of the Canadian contingent as had left England up to that time had been sent to the eastern field, to Egypt or the Dardanelles. With the exception of Sir John French's reports and the somewhere in France notes of eyewitness, a British officer at the front, England was taking her army on faith. And now I was there, and there frankly as a writer. Also I was a woman. I knew how the chivalrous English mind recoiled at the idea of a woman near the front. Their nurses were kept many miles in the rear. They had raised loud protests when three English women were permitted to stay at the front with the Belgian army. My knees were a bit weak as I went up the steps and into the hotel. They would hardly arrest me. My letters were from very important persons indeed, but they could send me away with expedition and dispatch. I had run the channel blockade to get there, and I did not wish to be sent away with expedition and dispatch. The hotel was cold and bare. Curious-eyed officers came in, stared at me, and went out. A French gentleman in a military cape walked round the bare room, spoke to the canaries in a grey cage in the corner, and came back to where I sat with my fur coat, lap-robe fashion, over my knees. "'Pardon,' he said. "'Are you the Duchess of Sutherland?' I regretted that I was not the Duchess of Sutherland. "'You came just now in a large car?' "'I did. "'You intend to stay here for some time?' "'I have not decided. "'Where did you come from?' I think I said, after a rather stunned pause, that I shall not tell you. Madame is very cautious. I felt convinced that he spoke with the authority of the army or of the town gendarmerie behind him, but I was irritated. Besides, I had been cautioned so much about telling where I had been, except in general terms, that I was even afraid to talk in my sleep. I think I said that it does not really matter where I came from, where I am going, or what I am doing here. I expected to see him throw back his cape and exhibit a sheriff's badge, or whatever its French equivalent. But he only smiled. In that case, he said cheerfully, I shall wish you a good morning. Goodbye, I said coldly, and he took himself off. I have never solved the mystery of that encounter. Was he merely curious, or scraping acquaintance with the only woman he had seen in months, or was he as imposing a person as he looked, and did he go away for a warrant or whatever was necessary, and return to find me safe in the lap of the British army? The canary bird sang, and a porter with a leather apron, having overcome a national inability to light a fire in the middle of the day, came to take me to my room. There was an odor of stewing onions in the air and soap suds, and a dog sniffed at me and barked because I addressed him in English and then General Huguet came, friendly and smiling and speaking English, and all was well. Afterward, I learned how that same diplomacy, which made me comfortable and at home with him at once, has made smooth the relations between the English and French armies. It was Chesterfield, wasn't it, who spoke of suavite in modo, fortite in re. That is General Huguet, a tall man, dark, keen, and of most soldierly bearing, Beside the genial downrightness of the British officers, he was urbane, suave, but full of decision. His post requires diplomacy, but not concession. Sir John French, he regretted to say, was at the front and would not return until late in the evening. But Colonel Fitzgerald hoped that I would come to luncheon at headquarters so that we might talk over what was best to be done. He would, if the arrangement suited me, return at one o'clock for me. It was half-past twelve. I made such concessions to the occasion as my traveling bag permitted, and prompt to the minute, General Huguet's car drew up at the inn door. It was a wonderful car. I used it all that afternoon and the next day, and I can testify both to its comfort and to its speed. I had traveled fast in cars belonging to the Belgian and French staffs, but never have I gone as I did in that marvel of a car. Somewhere among my papers, I have a sketch that I made of the interior of the limousine body. 
with the two soldier chauffeurs outside in front the two carbines strapped to the speedometer between the vis-a-vis -vis seats inside the car and the speedometer registering ninety kilometers and going up we went at once to british headquarters with its sentries and its flag a large house which had belonged to a notary its grim and forbidding exterior gave little promise of the comfort within a passage led to a square centre hall from which opened various rooms a library with a wood fire the latest possible london and paris papers a flat-top desk and a large map a very large drawing-room which is sir john french's private office with white walls panelled with rose brocade a marble mantel and a great centre table covered like the library desk with papers a dining-room wainscoted and comfortable there were other rooms which i did not see in the square hall an orderly sat all day waiting for orders of various sorts colonel fitzgerald greeted me amiably he regretted that sir john french was absent and was curious as to how i had penetrated to the fastnesses of british headquarters without trouble now and then glancing at him unexpectedly during the excellent luncheon that followed i found his eyes fixed on me thoughtfully intently it was not at all an unfriendly gaze rather it was the look of a man who is painstakingly readjusting his mental processes to meet a new situation he made a delightful host i sat at his right at the other end of the table was general huguet and across from me a young english nobleman attached to the field marshal's staff came in a few minutes late and took his place the prince of wales who lives there had gone to the trenches the day before two soldier servants served the meal there was red wine but none of the officers touched it the conversation was general and animated we spoke of public opinion in america of the resources of germany and her starvation cry of the probable length of the war on this opinions varied one of the officers prophesied a quick ending when the allies were finally ready to take the offensive the others were not so optimistic but neither here nor in any of the conversations i have heard at the headquarters of the allies was there a doubt expressed as to ultimate victory they had a quiet confidence that was contagious there was no bluster no assertion victory was simply accepted as a fact the only two opinions might be as to when it would occur and whether the end would be sudden or a slow withdrawal of the german forces the french algerian troops and the indian forces of great britain came up for discussion their bravery their dislike for trench fighting and intense longing to charge the inroads the bad weather had made on them during the winter one of the officers considered the american press rather pro-german the recent american note to sir edward gray and his reply with the press comments on both led to this statement the possibility of germany's intentionally antagonizing america was discussed but not at length from the press to the censorship was but a step i objected to the english method as having lost us our perspective on the war you allow anything to go through the censor's office that is not considered dangerous or too explicit i said false reports go through on an equality with true ones how can america know what to believe it was suggested by someone that the only way to make the censorship more elastic while retaining its usefulness in protecting military secrets and movements was to establish such a censorship at the front where it is easier to know what news would be harmful to give out and what may be printed with safety i mentioned what a high official of the admiralty had said to me about the censorship that it was an infernal nuisance but necessary but it is not true that messages are misleadingly changed in transmission said one of the officers at the table i had seen the head of the press censorship bureau and was able to repeat what he had said that where the cutting out of certain phrases endangered the sense of a message the words and or the were occasionally added that the sense might be kept clear but that no other additions or changes of meaning were ever made luncheon was over we went into the library and there consulting the map colonel fitzgerald and general huguet discussed where i might go that afternoon 
the mist of the morning had turned to rain and the roads at the front would be very bad besides it was felt that the chief should give me permission to go to the front and he had not yet returned how about seeing the indians asked colonel fitzgerald turning from the map i should like it very much the young officer was turned to and agreed like a british patriot and gentleman to show me the indian villages general huguet offered his car the officer got his sheepskin lined coat for the weather was cold thirty shillings he said and nothing goes through it i examined that coat it was smart substantial lined throughout with pure white fur and it had cost seven dollars and a half there is a very popular english word just making its place in america the word is swank it is both noun and verb one swanks when one swaggers one puts on swank when one puts on side and because i hold a brief for the english and because i was fortunate enough to meet all sorts of english people i want to say that there is very little swank among them the example of simplicity and genuineness has been set by the king and queen i met many different circles of people from the highest to the lowest there was a total absence of that arrogance which the american mind has so long associated with the english for fear of being thought to swagger an englishman will understate his case and so with the various english officers i met at the front there was no swank they were downright unassuming extremely efficient-looking men quick to speak of german courage ready to give the benefit of the doubt where unproved outrages were in question but rousing as i have said to pale fury where their troops were being unfairly attacked while the car was being brought to the door general huguet pointed out to me on the map where i was going as we stood there his pencil drew a light semicircle round the town of ypres a great battle he said and described it colonel fitzgerald took up the narrative so it happened that in the three different staff headquarters belgian french and english executive officers of the three armies in the western field described to me that great battle the frightful slaughter of the english their reinforcement at a critical time by general foch's french army of the north and the final holding of the line the official figures of casualties were given me again english forty five thousand out of a hundred and twenty thousand engaged the french seventy thousand and the german over two hundred thousand turning to the table colonel fitzgerald picked up a sheet of paper covered with figures it is interesting he said to compare the disease and battle mortality percentages of this war with the percentages in other wars to see considering the frightful weather and the trenches how little disease there has been among our troops compare the figures with the boer war for instance and even then our percentage has been somewhat brought up by the indian troops have many of them been ill they have felt the weather he replied not the cold so much as the steady rain and those regiments of english that have been serving in india have felt the change they particularly have suffered from frost-bitten feet i knew that more than once i had seen men being taken back from the british lines their faces twisted with pain their feet great masses of cotton and bandages which they guarded tenderly lest a chance blow add to their agony even the english system of allowing the men to rub themselves with lard and oil from the waist down before going into flooded trenches has not prevented the tortures of frostbite it was time to go and the motor was waiting we set off in a driving sleet that covered the windows of the car and made motoring even more than ordinarily precarious but the roads here were better than those nearer the coast wider too and not so crowded to ham where the indian regiment i was to visit had been retired for rest was almost twenty miles ham i said what a place to send mohammedans to in his long dispatch of february seventeenth sir john french said of the indian troops the indian troops have fought with the utmost steadfastness and gallantry whenever they have been called upon this is the answer to many varying statements as to the efficacy of the assistance furnished by her indian subjects to the british empire at this time for sir john french is a soldier not a diplomat 
no question of the union of the empire influences his reports the indians have been valuable or he would not say so he is cherry of praise is the field marshal of the british army but there is another answer that everywhere along the british front one sees the gurkhas slant-eyed and mongolian with their broad-brimmed khaki-colored hats filling posts of responsibility they are little men smaller than the sikhs rather reminiscent of the japanese in build and alertness when i was at the english front some of the sikhs had been retired to rest but even in the small villages on billet relaxed and resting they were a fine and soldierly looking body of men showing race and their ancient civilization it has been claimed that england called on her indian troops not because she expected much assistance from them but to show the essential unity of the british empire the plain truth is however that she needed the troops needed men at once needed experienced soldiers to eke out her small and purely defensive army of regulars volunteers had to be equipped and drilled a matter of months to say that she called to her aid barbarians is absurd the gurkhas are fierce fighters but carefully disciplined compare the lances of the indian cavalry regiments and the kukri the gurkha knife with the petrol squirts hand grenades aeroplane darts and asphyxiating bombs of germany and call one barbarian to the advantage of the other the truth is of course that war itself is barbarous end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front by mary roberts reinhardt chapter twenty seven a strange party the road to ham turned off the main highway south of air it was a narrow clay road in unspeakable condition the car wallowed along once we took a wrong turning and were obliged to go back and start again it was still raining indian horsemen beat their way stolidly along the road we passed through hamlets where cavalry horses in ruined stables were scantily protected where the familiar omnibuses of london were parked in what appeared to be hundreds the cocoa and other advertisements had been taken off and they had been hastily painted a yellowish gray here and there we met one on the road filled and overflowing with troops and looking curiously like the rubberneck wagons of new york aside from the transports and a few small indian ammunition carts with open bodies made of slats and drawn by two mules with an impassive turban driver calling strange words to his team there was no sign of war no bombarding disturbed the heavy atmosphere no aeroplanes were overhead there was no barbed wire no trenches only muddy sugar-beet fields on each side of the narrow road a few winter trees and the beat of the rain on the windows at last with an extra lurch the car drew up in the village of ham at a gate in a brick wall a scotch soldier in kilts carrying a rifle came forward our errand was explained and he went off to find makand singh a major in the lahore lancers and in charge of the post it was a curious picture that i surveyed through the open door of the car we were in the center of the village and at the intersection of a crossroads was a tall cross with a life-size christ underneath the cross in varying attitudes of dampness and curiosity were a dozen indians mohammedans by faith some of them held horses which in spite of the rain they had been exercising one or two wore long capes to the knees with pointed hoods which fitted up over their great turbans bearded men with straight sensitive noses and oval faces even the absurdity of the cape and pointed hood failed to lessen their dignity they were tall erect soldierly looking 
and they gazed at me with the bland gravity of the East. Makan Singh came hastily forward, a splendid figure of a man, six foot two or thereabout, and appearing even taller by reason of his turban. He spoke excellent English. It is very muddy for a lady to alight, he said, and instructed one of the men to bring bags of sacking, which were laid in the road. You are seeing us under very unfavorable conditions, he said, as he helped me to alight, but there is a fire if you are cold. I was cold, so Makan Singh led the way to his living quarters. To go to them it was necessary to pass through a long shed, which was now a stable for perhaps a dozen horses. At a word of command, the Indian grooms threw themselves against the horses' heads and pushed them back. By stepping over the ground pegs to which they were tethered, I got through the shed somehow and into a small yard. Makand Singh turned to the right, and throwing open the low door of a peasant's house, stood aside to allow me to enter. It is not very comfortable, he explained, but it is the best we have. He was so tall that he was obliged to stoop as he entered the doorway. Within was an ordinary peasant's kitchen, but cleaner than the average, in spite of the weather, the floorboards were freshly scrubbed. The hearth was swept, and by the stove lay a sleek tortoise-shell cat. There was a wooden dresser, a chimney-shelf with rows of plates standing on it, and in a doorway, just beyond, an elderly peasant woman watching us curiously. "'Perhaps,' said Makan Singh, "'you will have coffee?' I was glad to accept, and the young officer, who had followed, accepted also. We sat down while the kettle was placed on the stove and the fire replenished. I glanced at the Indian major's tall figure. Even sitting, he was majestic. When he took the cape off, he was discovered clothed in the khaki uniform of his rank in the British Army. Except for the olive color of his skin, his turban, and the fact that his beard, the soft beard of one who has never shaved, was drawn up into a black net so that it formed a perfect crescent around the angle of his jaw. He might have been a gallant and interested English officer. For the situation assuredly interested him. His eyes were alert and keen. When he smiled, he showed rows of beautiful teeth, small and white. And although his face in repose was grave, he smiled often. He superintended the making of the coffee by the peasant woman and instructed her to prepare the table. She obeyed pleasantly. Indeed, it was odd to see that between this elderly Frenchwoman and her strange guests, people of whose existence on the earth I dare say she had never heard until this war, there was the utmost good will. Perhaps the Indians are neater than other troops. Certainly personal cleanliness is a part of their religion. Anyhow, whatever the reason, I saw no evidence of sulkiness toward the Indians, although I have seen surly glances directed toward many of the billeted troops of other nationalities. Conversation was rather difficult. We had no common ground to meet on, and the ordinary currency of polite society seemed inadequate, out of place. The weather must be terrible after India, I ventured. We do not mind the cold. We come from the north of India, where it is often cold. But the mud is bad. We cannot use our horses. You are a cavalry regiment, I ask, out of my abysmal ignorance. We are lancers, yes, and horses are not useful in this sort of fighting. From a room beyond there was a movement, followed by the entrance of a young Frenchman in a British uniform. Makan Singh presented him, and he joined the circle that waited for coffee. The newcomer presented an enigma, a Frenchman in a British uniform quartered with the Indian troops. It developed that he was a pupil from the Sorbonne in Paris, and was an interpreter. Everywhere afterward I found these interpreters with the British Army. Frenchmen, who for various reasons are disqualified from entering the French army in active service, and who are anxious to do what they can. They wear the British uniform, 
with the exception that instead of the stiff crown of the British cap, theirs is soft. They are attached to every battalion, for Tommy Atkins is in a strange land these days, a land that knows no more English than he knows French. True, he carries little books of French and English which tell him how to say, Porter, get my luggage and take it to a cab, or please bring me a laundry list, or give my kind regards to your parents. Imagine him trying to find the French for, look out, they're coming, to call to a French neighbor in the inevitable mix-up of the line during a melee, and finding only, these trousers do not fit well, or I would like an ice and then a small piece of cheese. It was a curious group that sat in a semicircle around that peasant woman's stove, waiting for the kettle to boil. The tall Indian major with his aristocratic face and long, quiet hands, the young English officer in his headquarters staff uniform, the French interpreter, and I. Just inside the door, the major's Indian servant, tall, impassive, and turbaned, stood with folded arms, looking over our heads and at the table the placid-faced peasant woman cut slices of yellow bread made with eggs and milk and poured our coffee it was very good coffee served black the woman brought a small decanter and placed it near me it is rum said the major and very good in coffee i declined the rum the interpreter took a little the major shook his head although they say that a Sikh never refuses rum, he said, smiling. Coffee over, we walked about the village. Hardly a village, a cluster of houses along unpaved lanes, which were almost impassable. There were tumbling stables full of horses, groups of Indians standing under dripping eaves for shelter, sentries here and there a peasant. The houses were replicas of the one where Makand Singh had his quarters. Although it was still raining, a dozen Indian lancers were exercising their horses. They dismounted and stood back to let us pass. Behind them, as they stood, was the great cross. That was the final picture I had of the village of Ham and the second Lahore lancers, the turban Indians with their dripping horses, the grave bow of Makan Singh as he closed the door of the car, and behind him a Scotch corporal in kilt and cap, with a cigarette tucked behind his ear. We went on. I looked back. Makan Singh was making his careful way through the mud. The horses were being led to a stable. The cross stood alone. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 of Kings, Queens, and Pawns an American Woman at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Kings, Queens, and Pawns, An American Woman at the Front by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Chapter 28. Sir John French. The next day I was taken along the English front, between the first and the second line of trenches, from Bethune, the southern extremity of the line, the English right flank, to the northern end of the line just below Ypres. In a direct line the British front at that time extended along some twenty-seven miles, but the line was irregular, and I believe was really well over thirty. I have never been in an English trench. I have been close enough to the advanced trenches to be shown where they lay and to see the slight break they make in the flat country. I was never in a dangerous position at the English front, if one accepts the fact that all of that portion of the country between the two lines of trenches is exposed to shell fire. No shells burst near me. Bethune was being intermittently shelled, but as far as I know, not a shell fell in the town while I was there. I lunched on a hill surrounded by batteries, with the now celebrated towns of Messine and Wysheet, just across a valley, so that one could watch shells bursting over them, and still nothing threatened my peace of mind 
or my physical well-being and yet it was one of the most interesting days of a not uneventful period in the morning i was taken still in general huguet's car to british headquarters again to meet sir john french i confess to a thrill of excitement when the door into his private office was opened and i was ushered in the field marshal of the british army was standing by his table he came forward at once and shook hands in his khaki uniform with the scarlet straps of his rank on collar and sleeves he presented a most soldierly and impressive appearance a man of middle height squarely and compactly built he moves easily he is very erect and his tanned face and gray hair are in strong contrast a square and determined jaw very keen blue eyes and a humorous mouth that is my impression of sir john french we are sending you along the lines he said when i was seated but not into danger i hope you do not want to go into danger i wish i might tell of the conversation that followed it is impossible not that it dealt with vital matters but it was understood that sir john was not being interviewed he was taking a little time from a day that must have been crowded to receive with beautiful courtesy a visitor from overseas that was all there can be no objection i think to my mentioning one or two things he spoke of of his admiration for general foch whom i had just seen of the tribute he paid to the courage of the indian troops and of the marvellous spirit all the british troops had shown under the adverse weather conditions prevailing all or most of these things he has said in his official dispatches other things were touched on the possible duration of the war the new problems of what is virtually a new warfare the possibility of a pestilence when warm weather came owing to inadequately buried bodies the canadian troops had not arrived at the front at that time although later in the day i saw their transports on the way or i am sure he would have spoken of them i should like to hear what he has to say about them after their recent gallant fighting i should like to see his fine blue eyes sparkle the car was at the door and the same young officer who had taken me about on the previous day entered the room i am putting you in his care said sir john indicating the new arrival because he has a charmed life nothing will happen if you are with him he eyed the tall young officer affectionately he has been fighting since the beginning he said handling a machine gun in all sorts of terrible places and nothing ever touches him a discussion followed as to where i was to be taken there was a calm heap near the givenchy brickyards which was rather favored as a lookout spot in spite of my protests that was ruled out as being under fire at the time bethune was being shelled but not severely i would be taken to bethune and along the road behind the trenches but nothing was to happen to me sir john french knitted his gray brows and suggested a visit to a wood where the soldiers had built wooden walks and put up signs naming them piccadilly regent street and so on i should like to see something i put in feebly i appreciated their kindly solicitude but after all i was there to see things to take risks if necessary but to see then said sir john with decision we will send you to a hill from which you can see the trip was arranged while i waited then he went with me to the door and there we shook hands he hoped i would have a comfortable trip and bowed me out most courteously but in the doorway he thought of something have you a camera with you i had and said so a very good camera i hope you do not mind if i ask you not to use it i did not mind i promised at once to take no pictures and indeed at the end of the afternoon i found my unfortunate camera on the floor much buffeted and kicked about and entirely ignored the interview with sir john french had given me an entirely unexpected impression of the field marshal of the british army i had read his reports fully and from those unemotional reports of battles of movements and counter movements i had formed a picture of a great soldier without imagination to whom a battle was an issue not a great human struggle an austere man i had found a man with a fighting jaw 
and a sensitive mouth and a man greatly beloved by the men closest to him a human man a soldier not a writer and after seeing and talking with sir john french i am convinced that it is not his policy that dictates the silence of the army at the front he is proud of his men proud of each heroic regiment of every brave deed he would like i am sure to shout to the world the names of the heroes of the british army to publish great rolls of honor but silence or comparative silence has been the decree there must be long hours of suspense when the field marshal of the british army paces the floor of that gray and rose brocade drawing-room hours when the orders he has given are being translated into terms of action of death of wounds but sometimes thank god into terms of victory long hours when the wires and the dispatch riders bring in news valiant names gains losses names that are not to be told brave deeds that lacking chroniclers must go unrecorded read this from the report sir john french sent out only a day or so before i saw him the troops composing the army of france have been subjected to as severe a trial as it is possible to impose upon any body of men the desperate fighting described in my last dispatch had hardly been brought to a conclusion when they were called upon to face the rigors and hardships of a winter campaign frost and snow have alternated with periods of continuous rain the men have been called upon to stand for many hours together almost up to their waists in bitterly cold water separated by only one or two hundred yards from a most vigilant enemy although every measure which science and medical knowledge could suggest to mitigate these hardships was employed the sufferings of the men have been very great in spite of all this they present a most soldierlike splendid though somewhat war-worn appearance their spirit remains high and confident their general health is excellent and their condition most satisfactory i regard it as most unfortunate that circumstances have prevented any account of many splendid instances of courage and endurance in the face of almost unparalleled hardship and fatigue in war coming regularly to the knowledge of the public so it is clearly not the fault of sir john french that england does not know the names of her heroes or that their families are denied the comfort of knowing that their sons fought bravely and died nobly it is not the fault of the british people waiting eagerly for news that does not come surely in these inhuman times some concession should be made to the humanities war is not moving pawns in a game it is a struggle of quivering flesh and agonized nerves of men fighting and dying for ideals heroism is much more than duty it is idealism no leader is truly great who discounts this quality america has known more of the great human interest of this war than england english people get the news from great american dailies it is an unprecedented situation and so far the english people have borne it almost in silence but as the months go on and only bare official dispatches reach them there is a growing tendency to protest they want the truth a picture of conditions they want to know what their army is doing what their sons are doing and they have a right to know they are making tremendous sacrifices and they have a right to know to what end the greatest agent in the world for moulding public opinion is the press the germans know this and have used their journal skillfully to underestimate the power of the press to fail to trust to its good will and discretion is to refuse to wield the mightiest instrument in the world for influencing national thought and national action at times of great crisis the press has always shown itself sane conservative safe eminently to be trusted the english know the power of the great modern newspaper not only to reflect but to form public opinion they have watched the american press because they know to what extent it influences american policy there is talk of conscription in england today why ask the british people 
asked the london times ask rural england where away from the tramp of soldiers in the streets the roll of drums the visual evidence of a great struggle patriotism is asked to feed on the ashes of war self-depreciation in a nation is as great an error as over-complacency lack of full knowledge is the cause of much of the present british discontent let the british people be told what their army is doing let lord kitchener announce its deeds its courage its vast unselfishness let him put the torch of publicity to the national pride and see it turn to a white flame of patriotism then it will be possible to tear the recruiting posters from the walls of london and the remotest roads of england will echo to the tramp of marching men End of chapter 28chapter twenty nine of kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front chapter twenty nine along the great bethune road Again and again through these chapters I have felt apologetic for the luxurious manner in which I frequently saw the war, and so now I hesitate to mention the comfort of that trip along the British lines, the substantial and essentially British foresight and kindness that had stocked the car with sandwiches wrapped in white paper, the good roads, the sense of general well-being that spread like a contagion from a well-fed and well-cared-for army. There is something about the British Army that inspires one with confidence. It is a pity that those people who sit at home in Great Britain and shrug their shoulders over the daily papers cannot see their army at the front. It is not a roast beef stolidity. It is rather the steadiness of calm eyes and good nerves, of physically fit bodies and clean minds. I felt it when I saw Kitchener's army of clear-eyed boys drilling in Hyde Park. I got it from the quiet young officer, still in his twenties, who sat beside me in the car, and who, having been in the war from the beginning, handling a machine-gun all through the Battle of Ypres, when his regiment, the Grenadier Guards, suffered so horribly, was willing to talk about everything but what he had done. We went first to Bethune. The roads as we approached the front were crowded, but there was no disorder. There were motor bicycles and side cars carrying dispatch riders and scouts, traveling kitchens, great lorries, small light cars for supplies needed in a hurry, cars which make greater speed than the motor vans, omnibuses full of troops, and steam tractors or caterpillar engines for hauling heavy guns. The day was sunny and cold. The rain of the day before had turned to snow in the night, and the fields were dazzling. In the east, said the officer with me, where there is always snow in the winter, the Germans have sent out to their troops white helmet covers and white smocks to cover the uniforms. But snow is comparatively rare here, and it has not been considered necessary. At a small bridge ten miles from Bethune, he pointed out a house as marking the farthest advance of the German army, reached about the 11th of October. There was no evidence of the hard fighting that had gone on along this road. It was a peaceful scene, the black branches of the overarching trees lightly powdered with snow. But the snowy fields were full of unmarked mounds. Another year and the mounds will have sunk to the level of the ground. Another year and only history will tell the story of that October of 1914 along the Great Bethune Road. An English aeroplane was overhead. There were armored cars on the road going toward the front, top-heavy machines that made surprisingly little noise considering their weight. Some had a sort of conning tower at the top. They looked somber, menacing. The driving of these cars over slippery roads must be difficult. Like the vans, they keep as near the center of the road as possible, allowing lighter traffic to turn out to pass them. 
a van had broken down and was being repaired at one of the wayside repair shops maintained everywhere along the roads for this war of machinery men in khaki with leather aprons were working about it while the driver stood by smoking a pipe as we went on we encountered the indian troops again the weather was better and they thronged the roads driving their tiny carts cleaning arms and accoutrement in sunny doorways proud and haughty in appearance even when attending to the most menial duties from the little ammunition carts like toy wagons they gazed gravely at the car and at the unheard-of spectacle of a woman inside side by side with the indians were scots in kilts making up with cheerful impudence for the indians lack of curiosity there were more gurkhas carrying rifles and walking lightly beside forage carts driven by british tommies there were hundreds of these carts taking hay to the cavalry divisions the gurkhas looked more japanese than ever in the clear light their broad-brimmed khaki hats have a strap that goes under the chin the strap or their black slanting eyes or perhaps their rather flattened noses and pointed chins give them a look of cruelty that the other indian troops do not have they are hard and relentless fighters i believe and they look it the conversation in the car turned to the feeding of the army the british army is exceedingly well fed said the young officer in the trenches also always the men are four days in the trenches and four out when the weather is too bad for anything but sniping the inactivity of the trench life and the abundant ration gets them out of condition on their four days in reserve it is necessary to drill them hard to keep them in condition this proved to be the explanation of the battalions we met everywhere marching briskly along the roads i do not recall the british ration now but it includes in addition to meat and vegetables tea cheese jam and bacon probably not all at once but giving that variety of diet so lacking to the unfortunate belgian army food is one of the principal munitions of war no man fights well with an empty stomach food sinks into the background only when it is assured and plentiful deprived of it its need becomes insistent an obsession that drives away every other thought so the wise british army feeds its men well and lets them think of other things such as war and fighting and love of country and brave deeds but food has not always been plentiful in the british army there were times last fall when what with german artillery bombardment and shifting lines it was difficult to supply the men my servant said the officer found a hare somewhere and in a deserted garden a handful of carrots word came to the trench where i was stationed that at dark that night he would bring out a stew we were very hungry and we waited eagerly but just as it was cooked and ready a german shell came down the chimney of the house where he was working and blew up stove and stew and everything it was one of the greatest disappointments i ever remember we were in bethune at last a crowded town larger than any i had seen since i left dunkirk so congested were its narrow streets with soldiers mounted and on foot and with all the ghastly machinery of war that a traffic squad had taken charge and was directing things on some streets it was possible to go only in one direction i looked about for the signs of destruction that had grown so familiar to me but i saw none evidently the bombardment of bethune has not yet done much damage a squad of artillerymen marched by in perfect step their faces were keen bronzed they were fine-looking well set up men as smart as english artillerymen always are i watched them as long as i could see them we had lost our way owing to the regulations of the traffic squad it was necessary to stop and inquire then at last we crossed a small bridge over the canal and were on our way along the front behind the advanced trenches and just in front of the second line for a few miles the country was very level the firing was on our right the second line of trenches on our left the congestion of bethune had given way to the extreme peace in daylight of the region just behind the trenches there were few wagons few soldiers nothing could be seen except an occasional cloud 
where shrapnel had burst. The British Army was keeping me safe, as it had promised. There were, however, barbed wire entanglements everywhere, built, I thought, rather higher than the French. Roads to the right led to the advanced trenches, empty roads which at night are thronged with men going to the front or coming back. Here and there one saw a sentry, and behind him a tent of curious mottled shades of red, brown, and green. They look as though they were painted, I said, rather bewildered. They are, the officer replied promptly. From an aeroplane these tents are absolutely impossible to locate. They merge into the colors of the fields. Now and then, at a crossroads, it was necessary to inquire our way. I had no wish to run into danger, but I was conscious of a wild longing to have the car take the wrong turning and land abruptly at the advanced trenches. Nothing of the sort happened, however. We passed small buildings converted into field hospitals and flying the white flag with the Red Cross. There are no nurses in these hospitals, explained the officer, only one surgeon and a few helpers. The men are brought here from the trenches and then taken back at night in ambulances to the railroad or to base hospitals. Are there no nurses at all along the British front? None whatever. There are no women here in any capacity. That is why the men are so surprised to see you. Here and there, behind the protection of groves and small thickets, were temporary camps, sometimes tents, sometimes tent-shaped shelters of wood. There were batteries on the right everywhere, great guns concealed in farmyards, or, like the guns I had seen on the French front, in artificial hedges. Some of them were firing, but the firing of a battery amounts to nothing but a great noise in these days of long ranges. Somewhere across the valley the shells would burst. We knew that. That was all. The conversation turned to the Prince of Wales, and to the responsibility it was to the various officers to have him in the trenches. Strenuous efforts had been made to persuade him to be satisfied with the work at headquarters, where he is attached to Sir John French's staff, but evidently the young heir to the throne of England is a man in spite of his youth. He wanted to go out and fight, and he had at last secured permission. He has had rather remarkable training, said the young officer, who was also his friend. First he was in Calais with the transport service. Then he came to headquarters and has seen how things are done there, and now he is at the front. Quite unexpectedly, round a turn in the road, we came on a great line of Canadian transports, American-built lorries with khaki canvas tops. Canadians were driving them, Canadians were guarding them. It gave me a homesick thrill at once to see these other Americans, of type so familiar to me, there in northern France. Their faces were eager as they pushed ahead. Some of the tent-shaped wooden buildings were to be temporary barracks for them. In one place the transports had stopped, and the men were cooking a meal beside the road. Someone had brought a newspaper, and a crowd of men had gathered round it. I wondered if it was an American paper. I would like to have stood on the running board of the machine as we went past, and called out that I too was an American, and God bless them but I fancy the young officer with me would have been greatly disconcerted at such an action. The English are not given to such demonstrations, but the Canadians would have understood, I know. Since that time the reports have brought great news of these Canadian troops, of their courage, of the loss of almost all their officers in the fighting at Neuve-Chapelle. But that sunny morning, when I saw them in the north of France, they were untouched by battle or sudden death. Their faces were eager, intent, earnest. They had come a long distance, and now they had arrived. And what next? Into the scene of war unexpectedly obtruded itself a bit of peace. A great cart came down a side road, drawn by two white oxen with heavy wooden yokes. Piled high in the cart were sugar beets. Some thrifty peasant was salvaging what was left of his crop. The sight of the oxen reminded me that I had seen very few horses. "'They are farther back,' said the officer. "'Of course, as you know, for the last two or three months it has been impossible to use the cavalry at all.' Then he told me a curious thing. He said that during the long winter wait the cavalry horses got much out of condition. 
the side roads were thick with mud and the main roads were being reserved for transports adequate exercises for the cavalry seemed impossible one detachment discovered what it considered a bright solution and sent to england for beagle hounds morning after morning the men rode after the hounds over the flat fields of france it was a welcome distraction and it kept the horses in working trim but the french objected they said their country was at war was being devastated by an alien army they considered riding to hounds no matter for what purpose an indecorous almost an inhuman thing to do under the circumstances so the hounds were sent back to england and the cavalry horses are now exercised in dejected strings along side roads as we went north the firing increased in intensity more english batteries were at work the german response was insistent we were approaching ypres this time from the english side and the great artillery duel of late february was in progress the country was slightly rolling its unevenness permitted more activity along our road batteries were drawn up at rest in the fields here and there in one place a dozen food kitchens in the road were cooking the midday meal the khaki-clad cooks frequently smoking as they worked ahead of this loomed two hills they rose abruptly treeless and precipitous on the one nearest to the german lines was a ruined tower the tower said the officer would have been a charming place for luncheon but the hill has been shelled steadily for several days i have no idea why the germans are shelling it there is nobody there end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front chapter thirty the military secret the second hill was our destination at the foot of it the car stopped and we got out a steep path with here and there a wooden step led to the summit at the foot of the path was a sentry and behind him one of the multicolored tents are you a good climber asked the officer i said i was and we set out the path extended only a part of the way to a place perhaps two hundred feet beyond the road where what we would call a cyclone cellar in america had been dug out of the hillside like the others of the sort i had seen it was muddy and uninviting practically a cave with a roof of turf the path ceased and it was necessary to go diagonally up the steep hillside through the snow from numberless guns at the base of the hill came steady reports and as we ascended it was explained to me that i was about to visit the headquarters of major general h commanding an army division the last person i brought here said the young officer smiling was the prince of wales we reached the top at last there was a tiny farmhouse a low stable with a thatched roof and towering over all the arms of a great windmill chickens cackled round my feet a pig grunted in a corner and apparently from directly underneath came the ear-splitting reports of a battery as it fired perhaps i would better go ahead and tell them you are coming said the officer these people have probably not seen a woman in months and the shock would be too severe we must break it gently so he went ahead and i stood on the crest of that wind-swept hill and looked across the valley to messine to wysheet and ypres the battlefield lay spread out like a map as i looked clouds of smoke over messine told of the bursting of shells major general h came hurrying out his quarters occupied the only high ground with the exception of the nearby hill with its ruined tower in the neighborhood of ypres here a week or so before had come the king of belgium to look with tragic eyes at all that remained to him of his country here had come visiting russian princes from the eastern field the king of england the prince of wales no obscurities except myself had ever penetrated so far 
into the fastness of the British lines. Later on in the day, I wrote my name in a visitor's book the officers have established there, wrote under sprawling royal signatures, under the boyish hand of the Prince of Wales, the irregular chirography of Albert of Belgium, the blunt and soldierly name of General Joffre. There are six officers stationed in the farmhouse, composing General H.'s staff, and, as things turned out, we did not require the white paper sandwiches, for we were at once invited to luncheon. Not a very elaborate luncheon, said General H., but it will give us a great deal of pleasure to share it. While the extra places were being laid, we went to the brow of the hill. Across the valley at the foot of a wooded ridge were the British trenches. The ground rose in front of them, thickly covered with trees, to the German position on the ridge. It looks from here like a very uncomfortable position, I said. The German position is better, isn't it? It is, said General H. grimly, but we shall take that hill before long. I am not sure, and my many maps do not say, but there is little doubt in my mind that the hill in question is the now celebrated Hill 60, of which so much has been published. As we looked across, shells were bursting round the church tower of Messines, and the batteries beneath were sending out ear-splitting crashes of noise. Ypres, less than three miles away, but partly hidden in mist, was echoing the bombardment, and to complete the pandemonium of sound, as we turned, a mitrailleuse in the windmill opened fire behind us. Practice, said General H., as I started. It is noisy here, I'm afraid. We went through the muddy farmyard back to the house. The staff was waiting, and we sat down at once to luncheon, at a tiny pine table drawn up before a window. It was not a good luncheon. The French wine was like vinegar, the food the ordinary food of the peasant whose house it was, but it was a cheerful meal in spite of the food, and in spite of a boil on General H.'s neck. The marvel of a woman being there seemed to grow, not diminish, as the meal went on. Next week, said General H., we are to have two parties of correspondence here. The penny papers come first, and later on the hay pennies. That brought the conversation, as usual, to the feeling about the war in America. Like all the other officers I had met, these men were anxious to have things correctly reported in America, being satisfied that the true story of the war would undoubtedly influence any wavering of public opinion in favor of the Allies. One of the officers was a Canadian, and for his benefit somebody told the following story, possibly by now familiar to America. Some of the Canadian troops took with them to England a bit of the dash and impatience of discipline of the great Northwest. The story in question is of a group of soldiers at night passing a sentry, who challenges them. Halt! Who goes there? Black Watch. Advance, Black Watch, and all's well. The next group is similarly challenged. Halt! Who goes there? Cameronians. Advance, Cameronians. The third group comes on. Halt! Who goes there? What the devil is that to you? Advance, Canadians. In the burst of mirth that followed, the Canadian officer joined. Then he told an anecdote also. British recruits, practicing passing a whispered order from one end of a trench to the other, received this message to pass along. Enemy advancing on right flank. Send reinforcements. When the message reached the other end of the trench, he said, it was, Enemy advancing with ham shank. Send three and fourpence. It was a gay little meal, the only breaks in the conversation when the great guns drowned out our voices. I wonder how many of those round that table are living today. Not all, it is almost certain. The German army almost broke through the English line at that very point in the late spring. The brave Canadians have lost almost all their officers in the field and a sickening percentage of their men. That little valley must have run deep with blood since I saw it that day in the sunlight. Luncheon was over. I wrote my name in the visitor's book, to the tune of such a bombardment as almost forbade speech, and accompanied by General H., we made our way down the steep hillside to the car. 
sometime tonight i shall be in england i said as i settled myself for the return trip the smile died on the general's face it was as if in speaking of home i had touched the hidden cord of gravity and responsibility that underlay the cheerfulness of that cheery visit england he said that was all i looked back as the car started on a battery was moving up along the road behind the hill the sentry stood by his low painted tent the general was watching the car his hand shading his eyes against the glare of the winter sun behind him rose his lonely hill white with snow with a little path leading by devious ways up its steep and shining side it was not considered advisable to return by the road behind the trenches the late afternoon artillery duel was going on so we turned off a few miles south of the hill and left war behind us not altogether of course there were still transports and troops and at an intersection of three roads we were abruptly halted a line of military cars was standing there all peremptorily held up by a handful of soldiers the young officer got out and inquired there was little time to spare for i was to get to calais that evening and to run the channel blockade some time in the night the officer came back soon smiling a military secret he said we shall have to wait a little the road is closed so i sat in the car and the military secret went by i cannot tell about it except that it was thrillingly interesting my hands itched to get out my camera and photograph it just as they itch now to write about it but the mystery of what i saw on the high road back of the british lines is not mine to tell it must die with me my visit to the british lines was over as i look back i find that the one thing that stands out with distinctness above everything else is the quality of the men that constitute the british army in the field i had seen thousands in that one day but i had seen them also north of ypres at dunkirk at boulogne and calais on the channel boats i have said before that they show race but it is much more than a matter of physique it is a thing of steady eyes of high-held heads of a clean thrust of jaw the english are not demonstrative london compared with paris is normal british officers at the front and at headquarters treat the war as a part of the day's work a thing not to talk about but to do but my frequent meetings with british soldiers naval men members of the flying contingent and the army medical service revealed under the surface of each man's quiet manner a grimness a red heat of patriotism a determination to fight fair but to fight to the death they concede to the germans with the british sense of fairness courage science infinite resource and patriotism two things they deny them civilization and humanity civilization in its spiritual not its material side humanity of the sort that is the englishman's creed and his religion the safeguarding of non-combatants the keeping of the national word and the national honor my visit to the english lines was over i had seen no valiant charges no hand-to-hand -hand fighting but in a way i had had a larger picture i had seen the efficiency of the methods behind the lines the abundance of supplies the spirit that glowed in the eyes of every fighting man i had seen the colonial children of england in the field volunteers who had risen to the call of the mother country i had seen and talked with the commander-in-chief of the british forces and had come away convinced that the mother country had placed her honor in fine and capable hands and i had seen between the first and second lines of trenches an army of volunteers and patriots and gentlemen end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by naomi brewster of melbourne australia 
kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front by mary roberts reinhardt chapter thirty one queen mary of england the great european war affects profoundly all the women of each nation involved it affects doubly the royal women the queen of england the serena of russia the queen of the belgians the empress of germany each carries in these momentous days a frightful burden the young prince of wales is at the front the king of the belgians has been twice wounded the empress of germany has her sons as well as her husband in the field in addition to these cares these women of exalted rank have the responsibility that comes always to the very great to see a world crisis approaching to know every detail by which it has been furthered or retarded to see in a word every movement of the great drama and to be unable to check its denouement that has been a part of their burden and when the denouement came to sink their private anxieties in the public welfare to assume not a double immunity but a double responsibility to their people has been the other part it has required heroism of a high order it is to a certain extent a new heroism almost a demonstration of the new faith whose foundation is responsibility responsibility of a nation to its sons of rulers to their people of a man to his neighbour it has been my privilege to meet and speak with two of these royal women with the queen of england and with the queen of the belgians in each instance i carried away with me an ineradicable impression of this quality of a grave and wearing responsibility borne quietly and simply of a quiet courage that buries its own griefs and asks only to help from the beginning of the war i had felt a keen interest in the queen of england here was a great queen who had chosen to be first of all a wife and mother a queen with courage and a conscience and into her reign had come the tragedy of a war that affected every nation of the world many of them directly all of them indirectly the war had come unsought unexpected unprepared for peaceful england had become a camp the very palace in which the royal children were housed was open to an attack from a brutal enemy which added to the new warfare of this century the ethics of barbarism what did she think of it all what did she feel when that terrible roll of honour came in week by week that roll of honour with its photographs of splendid types of young manhood that no anglo-saxon can look at without a clutch at his throat what did she think when one by one the friends of her girlhood put on the black of bereavement and went uncomplainingly about the good works in which hers was the guiding hand what thoughts were hers during those anxious days before the prince of wales went to the front when like any other mother she took every possible moment to be with him walking about arm in arm with her boy talking of everything but the moment of parting and when at last i was permitted to see the queen of england i understood a part at least of what she was suffering i had been to the front i had seen the english army in the field i had been quite close to the very trenches where the boyish prince of wales was facing the enemies of his country and doing it with high courage and i had heard the rumble of the great german guns as queen mary of england must hear them in her sleep even with no son in the field the queen of england would be working for the soldiers it is a part of the tradition of her house but a good mother is a mother to all the world when queen mary is supervising the great work of the needlework guild one feels sure that into each word of direction has gone a little additional tenderness because of this boy of hers at the front 
It is because of Her Majesty's interest in the material well-being of the soldiers at the front and because of her most genuine gratitude for America's part in this well-being that I took such pleasure in meeting the Queen of England. It was characteristic of Her Majesty that she put an American woman, a very nervous American woman, at her ease at once that she showed that American woman the various departments of her needlework guild under way, and that she conveyed, in every word she said, a deep feeling of friendship for America and her assistance to Belgium in the crisis. Although our ambassadors are still accredited to the court of St. James, the old palace has ceased to be the royal residence. The king still holds there his louvet, to which only gentlemen are admitted, but the formal drawing-rooms are held at Buckingham Palace. To those who have seen St. James during a Louvet, or to those London tourists who have watched the Scots Guards, or the Coldstream, or the Grenadiers, preceded by a splendid band swinging into the old friary court to perform the impressive ceremony of changing guard, the change in these days of war is most amazing. Friary Court is guarded by London policemen and filled with great vans piled high with garments and supplies for the front. That front where the Coldstream and the Grenadiers and the others, shorn of their magnificence, are waiting grimly in muddy trenches or leading charges to victory or the roll of honour. Under the winter sky of London, the crenulated towers and brick walls of the old palace give little indication of the former grandeur of this most historic of England's palaces, built on the site of an old leper hospital and still retaining the name of the saint to whom that hospital was dedicated. There had been a shower just before I arrived, and although it was February, there was already a hint of spring in the air. The sun came out, drying the roads in the park close by and shining brightly on the lovely English grass, green even then with the green of June at home. Riders, caught in the shower and standing by the sheltered sides of trees for protection, took again to the bridle paths. The hollows of Friary Court were pools where birds were splashing, as I got out of my car, a boy scout emerged from the palace and carried a large parcel to a waiting van. Do you want the QMNG? said a tall policeman. This, being interpreted, I was given to understand was Queen Mary's Needlework Guild. Later on, when I was taken to Buckingham Palace to write my name in the Queen's book, which is etiquette after a presentation, there was all the formality the visit to St. James's had lacked, the drive into the enclosure, where the guard was changing, the stately footman, the great book with its pages containing the dignitaries and great people of all the earth. But the Boy Scout and the policeman had restored my failing courage that day at St. James Palace. Except for a tendency to breathe at twice my normal rate as the Queen entered the room, I felt almost calm. As she advanced towards us, stopping to speak cordially to the various ladies who were carrying on the work of the Guild for her, I had an opportunity to see this royal woman who has suffered so grossly from the camera. It will be a surprise to many Americans to learn that the Queen of England is very lovely to look at. So much emphasis has always been placed on her virtues and so little has been written of her charm, that this tribute is only fair to Her Majesty. She is tall, perhaps five feet eight inches, with deep blue eyes and beautiful colouring. She has a rather wide, humorous mouth. There is not a trace of austerity in her face or in any single feature. The whole impression was of sincerity and kindliness, with more than a trace of humour. I could quite believe, after I saw Her Majesty, the delightful story that I had heard from a member of her own circle, that now and then, when during some court solemnity an absurdity occurred, it was positively dangerous to catch the Queen's eye. 
Queen Mary came up the long room. As she paused and held out her hand, each lady took it and curtsied at the same time. The Queen talked, smiling as she spoke. There was no formality. Near at hand, the lady-in-waiting, who was in attendance, stood, sometimes listening, sometimes joining in the conversation. The talk was all of supplies. For these days in England, one thinks in terms of war. Certain things had come in, other things had gone or were going. For the Queen of England is today at the head of a great business, one that in a few months has already collected and distributed over a million garments, all new, all practical, all of excellent quality. The Queen came towards me and paused. There was an agonised moment while the lady-in-waiting presented me. Her Majesty held out her hand. I took it and bowed. The next instant she was speaking. She spoke at once of America, of what had already been done by Americans for the Belgians, both in England and in their desolated country, and she hastened to add her gratitude for the support they had given her guild. The response has been more than generous, said Her Majesty. We are very grateful. We are glad to find that the sympathy of America is with us. She expressed a desire also to have America know fully just what was being done with the supplies that are being constantly sent over, both from Canada and from the United States. Canada has been wonderful, she said. They are doing everything. The ready response of Canada to the demand for both troops and supplies appeared to have touched Her Majesty. She spoke at length about the troops, the distance they had come, the fine appearance the men made, and their popularity with the crowds when they paraded on the streets of London. I had already noticed this. A Canadian regiment was sure to elicit cheers at any time, although London, generally speaking, has ceased any but silent demonstration over the soldiers. Have you seen any of the English hospitals on the continent? asked the Queen. I have seen a number, Your Majesty. Do they seem well supplied? I replied that they appeared to be thoroughly equipped, but that the amount of supplies required was terrifying, and that at one time some of the hospitals had experienced difficulty in securing what they needed. One hospital in Calais, I said, received 12,000 pairs of bed socks in one week last autumn and could not get a bandage. Those things happened early in the war. We are doing much better now. England had not expected war. We were totally unprepared. And in the great analysis that is to come, that speech of the Queen of England is the answer to many questions. England had not expected war. Every roll of the drum as the men of the new army march along the streets, every readjustment necessary to a peaceful people suddenly thrust into war, every month added to the length of time it has taken to put England in force into the field, shifts the responsibility to where it belongs. Back of all fine questions of diplomatic negotiation, stands this one undeniable fact. To deny it is absurd. To accept it is final. What is your impression of the French and Belgian hospitals? Her Majesty inquired. I replied that none were so good as the English, that France had always depended on her nuns in such emergencies, and there being no nuns in France now, her hospital situation was still not good. The priests of Belgium are doing wonderful work, I said. They have suffered terribly during the war. It is very terrible, said Her Majesty. Both priests and nuns have suffered, as England has reason to know. The Queen spoke of the ladies connected with the Guild. They are really much overworked, she said. They are giving all their time, day after day. They are splendid and many of them, of course, are in great anxiety. Already by attack and her simplicity of manner, she had put me at my ease. The greatest people, I have found, have this quality of simplicity. When she spoke of the anxieties of her ladies, 
I wished that I could have conveyed to her, from so many Americans, their sympathy in her own anxieties, so keen at the moment, so unselfishly born. But the lady-in-waiting was speaking. Please tell the Queen about your meeting with King Albert. So I told about it. It had been unconventional, and the recital amused Her Majesty. I told it all to her, the things that insisted on slipping off my lap, and the King's picking them up, the old envelope he gave me on which to make notes of the interview, how I had asked him whether he would let me know when the interview was over, or whether I ought to get up and go, and finally, when we were standing talking before my departure, how I had suddenly remembered that I was not to stand nearer to His Majesty than six feet, and had hastily backed away and explained to his great amusement. Queen Mary laughed, then her face clouded. It is also very tragic, she said. Have you seen the Queen? I replied that the Queen of the Belgians had received me a few days after my conversation with the King. She is very sad said her majesty it is a terrible thing for her especially as she is a bavarian by birth from that to the ever imminent subject of the war itself was but a step an english officer had recently made a sensational escape from a german prison camp and having at last got back to england had been sent for by the king with the strange inconsistencies that seemed to characterise the behaviour of the Germans, the man to whom he had surrendered after a gallant defence had treated him rather well, but from that time on his story was one of brutalities and starvation. The officer in question had told me his story, and I ventured to refer to it. Her Majesty knew it quite well, and there was no mistaking the grief in her voice as she commented on it, especially on that part of it which showed discrimination against the British prisoners. Major V had especially emphasised the lack of food for the private soldiers and the fearful trials of being taken back along the lines of communication, some 52 men being locked in one of the small continental box cars which were built to carry only six horses. Many of them were wounded. They were obliged to stand, the floor of the car being inches deep with filth. For thirty hours they had no water and no air, and for three days and nights no food. I am to publish Major V's statement in America, Your Majesty, I said. I think America should know it, said the Queen. It is most unjust. German prisoners in England are well cared for. They are well fed, and games and other amusements are provided for them. They even play football. I stepped back as Her Majesty prepared to continue her visit around the long room, but she indicated that I was to accompany her. It was then that one realised that the Queen of England is the intensely practical daughter of a practical mother. Nothing that is done in this guild the successor of a similar guild founded by the late Duchess of Teck, Her Majesty's mother, escapes her notice. No detail is too small if it makes for efficiency. She selected at random garments from the tables and examined them for warmth, for quality, for utility. Generally, she approved. Before a great heap of heavy socks, she paused. The soldiers like the knitted ones, we are told, she said. These are not all knitted, but they are very warm. A baby sweater of hideous yellow raised in her something like wrath. All that labour, she said, and such a colour for a little baby. And again, when she happened on a pair of felt slippers, quite the largest slippers I have ever seen, she fell silent in sheer amazement. They amused her even while they shocked her. And again, as she smiled, I regretted that the photographs of the Queen of England may not show her smiling. A small canvas case, skilfully rolled and fastened, caught Her Majesty's attention. She opened it herself and revealed with evident pride its numerous contents. Many thousands of such cases had already been sent to the army. This one was a model of packing. 
it contained in its small compass an extraordinary number of things changes of under flannels extra socks an abdominal belt and in an enclosure towel soap toothbrush nail brush and tooth powder i am not certain but i believe there was also a pack of cards i am afraid i should never be able to get it all back again said her majesty so one of the ladies took it in charge and the queen went on my audience was over as her majesty passed me she held out her hand i took it and curtsied were you not frightened the night you were in the belgian trenches she inquired not half so frightened as i was this afternoon your majesty i replied she passed on smiling and now, when enough time has elapsed to give perspective to my first impressions of Queen Mary of England, I find that it loses nothing by this supreme test. I find that I remember her not as a great queen, but as a gracious and kindly woman, greatly beloved by those in her immediate circle, totally without arrogance, and of a simplicity of speech and manner that must put to shame at times those lesser lights that group themselves about a throne i find another impression also that the queen of england is intensely and alertly mental alive to her fingertips we should say in america she has always been active her days are crowded a different type of royal woman would be content to be the honoured head of the queen's guild but she is in close touch with it at all times it is she who dictates its policy and so competently that the ladies who are associated with the work that has been done speak of her with admiration not unmixed with awe from a close and devoted friend of queen mary i obtained other characteristics to add to my picture that the queen is acutely sensitive to pain or distress in others it hurts her that she is punctual and this not because of any particular sense of time but because she does not like to keep other people waiting it is all a part of an overwhelming sense of that responsibility to others that has its origin in true kindliness the work of the queen's guild is surprising in its scope in a way it is a vast clearing-house supplies come in from every part of the world from india ceylon java alaska south america from the most remote places i saw the record book i saw that a woman from my home city had sent cigarettes to the soldiers through the guild that africa had sent flannels coming from a land where the sending as regards africa is all the other way i found this exciting indeed the whole record seems to show how very small the earth is and how the tragedy of a great war has overcome the barriers of distance and time and language from this clearing-house in england's historic palace built so long ago by bluff king hal these offerings of the world are sent wherever there is need to servia to egypt to south and east africa to the belgians the work was instituted by the queen the moment war broke out and three things are being very carefully ensured that a real want exists that the clothing reach its, its proper destination and that there shall be no overlapping the results have been most gratifying to the queen but it was difficult to get so huge a business for as i have already said it is a business now under way at the beginning demand was insistent there was no time to organize a system in advance it had to be worked out in actual practice one of the queen's ladies-in-waiting wrote in february apropos of the human element in the work there was a great deal of human element in the start with its various mistakes the queen wished on the breaking out of war to start the guild in such a way as to prevent the waste and overlapping which occurred in the boer war the fact that the ladies connected with the work have toiled daily and unceasingly for seven months is the most wonderful part of it all before christmas nine hundred and seventy thousand belts 
and socks were collected and sent as a special gift to the soldiers at the front from the queen and the women of the empire that in itself is an amazing record of efficiency it is rather comforting to know that there were mistakes in the beginning it is so human it is comforting to think of this exceedingly human queen being a party to them and being divided between annoyance and mirth as they developed it is very comforting also to think that in the end they were rectified we had a similar situation during our civil war there were mistakes then also and they too were rectified what the heroic women of the north and south did during that great conflict the women of great britain are doing today they are showing the same high and courageous spirit the same subordination of their personal griefs to the national cause the same cheerful relinquishment of luxuries it is a united britain that confronts the enemy in france it is a united womanhood united in spirit in labor in faith and high moral courage that looks east across the channel to that land beyond the horizon somewhere in france where the empire is fighting for life a united womanhood and at its head a steadfast and courageous queen and mother mary of england end of chapter thirty one Chapter 32 of Kings, Queens, and Pawns, An American Woman at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Kings, Queens, and Pawns, An American Woman at the Front. Chapter 32 The Queen of the Belgians. On the 3rd of August, 1914, the German army crossed the frontier into Belgium, and on the following day, the 4th, King Albert made his now famous speech to the joint meeting of the Belgian Chamber and Senate. Come what might, the Belgian people would maintain the freedom that was their birthright. I have faith in our destinies, King Albert concluded. A country which defends itself wins respect and cannot perish. With these simple and dignified words, Belgium took up the struggle. She was beaten before she began, and she knew it. No matter what the ultimate outcome of the war, she must lose. The havoc would be hers. The old battleground of Europe knew what war meant. No country in the world knew better. And, knowing, Belgium took up the burden. Today, Belgium is prostrate. That she lives, that she will rise again, no belgian doubts it may be after months even after years but never for a moment can there be any doubt of the national integrity the germans are in belgium but not of it belgium is still belgium not a part of the german empire until the germans are driven out she is waiting as i write this one corner of her territory remains to her a wedged shaped piece ten miles or so in width at the coast narrowing to nothing at a point less than thirty miles inland and in that tragic fragment there remains hardly an undestroyed town her revenues are gone being collected as an indemnity for god knows what by the germans king albert himself has been injured the queen of the belgians has pawned her jewels the royal children are refugees in england two-thirds of the army is gone and of even that tiny remaining corner much is covered by the salt floods of the sea the king of the belgians is often heard of we hear of him at the head of his army consulting his staff reviewing his weary and decimated troops we know his caliber now both as man and soldier he stands out as one of the truly heroic figures of the war but what of the bavarian-born queen of the belgians what of this royal woman who has lost the land of her nativity through the same war that has cost her the country of her adoption, who must see her husband go each day to the battle line, who must herself live under the shadow of hostile aeroplanes within earshot of the enemy's guns? 
what was she thinking of during those fateful hours when all night long king albert and his ministers debated the course of belgium a shameful immunity or a war what does she think now when before the windows of her villa at la panne the ragged and weary remnant of the brave belgian army lines up for review what does she hope for and pray for this queen without a country what she thinks we cannot know what she hopes for we may guess the end of war the return of her faithful people to their homes the reunion of families that the guns will cease firing so the long lines of ambulances will no longer fill the roads that the wounded will recover and that those that grieve may be comforted she has pawned her jewels when i saw her she wore a thin gold chain round her neck and on it a tiny gold heart i believe she has sacrificed everything else royal jewels have been pawned before this to support extravagant mistresses or to bolster a crumbling throne but elizabeth of belgium has pawned her jewels to buy supplies for wounded soldiers battle-scarred old belgium has not always had a clean slate but certainly this act of a generous and devoted queen should mark off many scores the queen is living at la panne a tiny fishing village and resort on the coast an ugly village robbed of quaintness by its rows of villas owned by summer visitors the villas are red and yellow brick built chateau fashion and set at random on the sand efforts at lawns have proved abortive the encroaching dunes gradually cover the grass here and there are streets and there is one main thoroughfare along which is a tramway that formerly connected the town with other villages on one side the sea on the other the dunes with little shade and no beauty such is the location of the new capital of belgium and here in one of the six small villas that house the court the king and queen of belgium with the crown prince are living they live very quietly walking together along the sands at those times when king albert is not with his troops faring simply waiting always as all belgium is waiting to-day waiting for the end of this terrible time i asked a member of the royal household what they did during those long winter evenings when the only sounds in the little village were the wash of the sea and the continual rumble of their artillery at newport what can we do he replied my wife and children are in brussels it is not possible to read and it is not wise to think too much we wait but waiting does not imply inaction the members of his majesty's household are all officers in the army i saw only one gentleman in civilian dress and he was the king's secretary m ingenbleek the king heads this activity and the queen of the belgians is never idle the ocean ambulance the great belgian base hospital is under her active supervision and its location near the royal villa makes it possible for her to visit it daily she knows the wounded soldiers who adore her indeed she is frankly beloved by the army her appearance is always the signal for a demonstration and again and again i saw copies of her photograph nailed up in sentry huts in soldiers billets in battered buildings that were temporary headquarters for divisions of the army in return for this devotion the young queen regards the welfare of the troops as her especial charge she visits them when they are wounded and many tales are told of her keen memory for their troubles one a wounded frenchman had lost his pipe when he was injured as he recovered he mourned his pipe other pipes were offered but they were not the same there had been something about the curve of the stem of the old one or the shape of the bowl whatever it was he missed it and it had been his sole possession at last the queen of the belgians had him describe the old pipe exactly i believe he made a drawing and she secured a duplicate of it for him he told me the story himself the queen had wished to go to the trenches to see the wretchedness of conditions at the front and to discover what she could do to ameliorate them one excursion she had been permitted at the time i saw her to the great anxiety of those who knew of the trip she was quite fearless 
and went into one of the trenches at the railroad embankment of Pervise. I saw that trench afterward. It was proudly decorated with a sign that said, Repose de la Reine, and above the board was the plaster head of a saint from one of the churches. Both sign and head, needless to say, were carefully protected from German bullets. Everywhere I went I found evidences of devotion to this girlish and tender-hearted queen. I was told of her farewell to the leading officials of the army and of the court, when having remained to the last possible moment, King Albert insisted on her departure from Brussels. I was told of her incognito excursions across the dangerous channel to see her children in England. I was told of her single-hearted devotion to the king, her belief in him, her confidence that he can do no wrong. So, when a great and bearded individual, much given to bowing, presented himself at the door of my room in the hotel at Dunkirk, and extended to me a notification that the Queen of the Belgians would receive me the next day at the royal villa at La Panne, I was keenly expectant. I went over my wardrobe. It was exceedingly limited and more than a little worn. Furs would cover some of the deficiencies, but there was a difficulty about shoe buttons. Dunkirk apparently laces its shoes. After a period of desperation, two top buttons were removed and sewed on lower down, where they would do the most good. That and much brushing was all that was possible. My total war equipment comprising one small suitcase, two large notebooks, and a fountain pen. I had been invited to lunch at a town on my way to La Panne, but the luncheon was deferred. When I passed through, my would-be entertainer was eating bully beef out of a tin with a cracker or two, and shells were falling inhospitably. Suddenly, I was not hungry. I did not care for food. I did not care to stop to talk about food. It was a very small town, and there were bricks and glass and plaster in the streets. There were almost no people, and those who were there were hastily preparing for flight. It was a wonderful Sunday afternoon, brilliantly sunny. A German aeroplane hung overhead and called the bull's-eyes. From the plane near there were firing at it, but the shells burst below. One could see how far they fell short by the clouds of smoke that hung suspended beneath it, floating like shadowy balloons. I felt that the aeroplane had its eyes on my car. They drop darts, do the aeroplanes, two hundred and more at a time, small pencil-shaped arrows of steel, six inches long, extremely sharp, and weighted at the point end. I did not want to die by a dart. I did not want to die by a shell. As a matter of fact, I did not want to die at all. So the car went on, and luncheonless I met the Queen of the Belgians. The royal villa at La Panne faces the sea. It is at the end of the village, and the encroaching dunes have ruined what was meant to be a small lawn. The long grass that grows out of the sand is the only vegetation about it, and outside, half buried in the dune, is a marble seat, a sentry box or two, and sentries with carbines pacing along the sand, the constant swish of the sea wind through the dead winter grass, the half-buried garden seat, that is what the Queen of the Belgians sees as she looks from the window of her villa. The villa itself is small and ugly. The furnishing is the furnishing of a summer seaside cottage. The windows fit badly and rattle in the gale. In the long drawing-room, really a living-room, in which I waited for the Queen, a heavy red curtain had been hung across the lower part of the long French windows that faced the sea, to keep out the draught. With that and an open coal fire, the room was fairly comfortable. As I waited, I looked about. Rather a long room, this, which has seen so many momentous discussions, so much tragedy and real grief. A chaotic room, too, for, in addition to its typical villa furnishing of chintz-covered chairs and a sofa or two, an ordinary pine table by a side window was littered with papers. On a center table were books, H. G. Wells, The War in the Air, two American books written by correspondents who had witnessed the invasion of Belgium, and several newspapers. A hideous marble bust on a pedestal occupied a corner, and along a wall 
was a very small cottage piano on the white marble mantel were a clock and two candlesticks except for a great basket of heather on a stand a gift to her majesty the room was evidently just as its previous owners had left it a screen just inside the door a rather worn rug on the floor and a small brocade settee by the fireplace completed the furnishing the door opened and the queen entered without ceremony i had not seen her before in her simple blue dress with its white lawn collar and cuffs she looked even more girlish than i had anticipated like queen mary of england she had suffered from the camera she is indeed strikingly beautiful with lovely coloring and hair and with very direct wide eyes set far apart she is small and slender and moves quickly she speaks beautiful english in that softly inflected voice of the continent which is the envy of all american women i bowed as she entered and she shook hands with me at once and asked me to sit down she sat on the sofa by the fireplace like the queen of england like king albert her first words were of gratitude to america it is not my intention to record here anything but the substance of my conversation with queen elizabeth of belgium much that was said was the free and unrestricted speech of two women talking over together a situation which was tragic to them both for queen elizabeth allowed me to forget as i think she had ceased to remember her own exalted rank in her anxiety for her people a devoted churchwoman she grieved over the treatment accorded by the invading german army to the priests and nuns of belgium she referred to her own bavarian birth and to the confidence both king albert and she had always felt in the friendliness of germany i am a bavarian she said i have always from my childhood heard this talk that germany must grow must get to the sea i thought it was just talk a pleasantry she had seen many of the diaries of german soldiers had read them in the very room where we were sitting she went quite white over the recollection and closed her eyes it is the women and children she said it is terrible there must be killing that is war but not this other thing and later on she said in reference to german criticism of king albert's course during the early days of the war any one who knows the king knows that he cannot do a wrong thing it is impossible for him he cannot go any way but straight and queen elizabeth was right any one who knows king albert of belgium knows that he cannot go any way but straight the conversation shifted to the wounded soldiers and to the queen's anxiety for them i spoke of her hospital as being a remarkable one practically under fire but moving as smoothly as a great american institution thousands of miles from danger she had looked very sad but at the mention of the ocean ambulance her face brightened she spoke of its equipment of the difficulty in securing supplies of the new surgery which has saved so many limbs from amputation they were installing new and larger sterilizers she said things are in as good condition as can be expected now she said the next problem will come when we get back into our own country what are the people to do so many of the towns are gone so many farms are raised the queen spoke of brand whitlock and praised highly his work in brussels from that to the relief work was only a step i spoke of the interest america was taking in the relief work and of the desire of so many american women to help we are grateful for anything she said the army seems to be as comfortable as is possible under the circumstances but the people of course need everything inevitably the conversation turned again to the treatment of the belgian people by the germans to the unnecessary and brutal murders of non-combatants to the frightful raping and pillage of the early months of the war her majesty could not understand the skepticism of america on this point i suggested that it was difficult to say what any army would do when it found itself in a prostrate and conquered land the belgian army would never have behaved so said her majesty nor the english nor the french never and the queen of the belgians is a german true she has suffered much perhaps she is embittered 
but there was no bitterness in her voice that afternoon in the little villa at La Pan, only sadness and great sorrow, and with it deep conviction. What Queen Elizabeth of Belgium says she believes, and who should know better? There, to that house on the sea front, in the fragment of Belgium that remains, go all the hideous details that are war. She knows them all. King Albert is not a figurehead. He is the actual fighting head of his army. The murder of Belgium has been done before his very eyes. In those long evenings when he has returned from headquarters, when he and Queen Elizabeth sit by the fire in the room that overlooks the sea, when every blast that shakes the windows reminds them both of that little army, two-thirds gone, shivering in the trenches only a mile or two away, or of their people beyond the dead line, suffering both deprivation and terror, what pictures do they see in the glowing coals? It is not hard to know. Queen Elizabeth sees her children and the puzzled boyish faces of those who are going down to the darkness of death that another nation may find a place in the sun. What King Albert sees may not all be written, but this is certain. Both these royal exiles, this soldier king, who has won and deserved the admiration of the world, this queen who refuses to leave her husband and her wounded, though day after day hostile aeroplanes are overhead and the roar of German guns is in her ears, these royal exiles live in hope and in deep conviction. They will return to Belgium. Their country will be theirs again. Their houses will be restored. Their fields will be sown and yield harvest, not for Germany, but for Belgium. Belgium as Belgium will live again. End of chapter 32「Kings, Queens, Ponds, and American Woman on the Front」。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Kings, Queens, and Ponds, an American Woman at the Front by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Chapter 33 The Red Badge of Mercy immediately on the declaration of war by the powers the vast machinery of mercy was put in the field the mobilization of the red cross army began that great army which is of no nation but of all nations of no creed but of all faiths of one flag for all the world and that flag the banner of the crusaders the red cross is the wounded soldier's last defence worn as a brassard on the left arm of its volunteers it conveys a higher message than the victoria cross of england the iron cross of germany or the cross of the legion of honor of france it is greater than cannon greater than hate greater than bloodlust greater than vengeance it triumphs over wrath as good triumphs over evil direct descendant of the cross of the christian faith it carries on to every battlefield the words of the man of peace blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy the care of the wounded in war has been the problem of the ages. Richard the Lionheart took a hospital ship to the coast of Palestine. The German people of the Middle Ages had their wounded in battle treated by their wives, who followed the army for that purpose. It remained for Frederick I of Prussia to establish a military service in connection with a standing army. With the invention of firearms, battlefield surgery faced new problems, notably hemorrhage, and took a step forward to meet these altered conditions. It was a French surgeon who solved the problem of hemorrhage by tying the torn blood vessels above the injury. To England goes the credit for the prevention of sepsis, as far as it may be prevented on a battlefield. As far as it may be prevented on a battlefield, for that is the question that confronts the machinery of mercy today. Transportation to the hospitals has been solved to a large extent by motor ambulances, by hospital trains, by converted channel steamers connecting the continent with England. Hospitals in the western field of war are now plentiful and some are well equipped. The days of bedding wounded men down on straw are largely in the past, but how to prevent the ravages of dirt, the so-called dirt diseases of gaseous gangrene, blood poisoning, tetanus, is the problem. I did not see the first exchange of hopelessly wounded prisoners that took place at Flushing while I was on the continent. It must have been a tragic sight. They lined up in two parties at the railroad station, German surgeons and nurses with British prisoners. British surgeons and nurses 
with german prisoners then they were counted off i am told ten germans came forward ten british in wheeled chairs on crutches the sightless ones led the exchange was made then ten more and so on what a sight what a horror no man there would ever be whole again there were men without legs without arms blind men men twisted by fearful body wounds two hundred and sixteen british officers and men and as many germans were exchanged that day they were however in the best of spirits said the london times of the next day at folkestone a crowd was waiting on the quay and one may be sure that heads were uncovered as the men limped or were led or wheeled down the gangplank kindly english women gave them nosegays of snowdrops and violets and then they went on to what for a few weeks or months they will be the objects of much kindly sympathy in the little towns where they live visitors will be taken to see them the neighborhood will exert itself in kindness but after a time interest will die away and besides there will be many to divide sympathy the blind man or the man without a leg or an arm will cease to be the neighborhood's responsibility and will become its burden what then for that is the problem that is facing each nation at war to make a whole life out of a fragment to teach that the spirit may be greater than the body to turn to usefulness these sad and hopeless by-products of battlefields the ravages of war to the lay mind consist mainly of wounds as a matter of fact they divide themselves into several classes all different all requiring different care handling and treatment and all in their several ways dependent for help on the machinery of mercy in addition to injuries on the battlefield there are illnesses contracted on the field septic conditions following even slight abrasions or minor wounds and nervous conditions sometimes approximating a temporary insanity due to prolonged strain to incessant firing close at hand to depression following continual lack of success to the sordid and hideous conditions of unburied dead rotting in full view for weeks and even months during the winter frozen feet sometimes requiring amputation and even in mild cases entailing great suffering took thousands of men out of the trenches the trouble resulted from standing for hours and even days in various depths of cold water and was sometimes given the name water bite soldiers were instructed to rub their boots inside and out with whale oil and to grease their feet and legs unluckily only fortunately situated men could be so supplied and the suffering was terrible surgeons who have observed many cases of both frost and water bite say that curiously enough the left foot is more frequently and seriously affected than the right the reason given is that right-handed men automatically use the right foot more than the left make more movements with it the order to remove boots twice a day for a few moments while in the trenches had a beneficial effect among certain battalions the british soldier who wraps tightly a khaki putty round his leg and thus hampers circulation has been a particular sufferer from frostbite in spite of the precaution he takes to grease his feet and legs before going into the trenches the presence of septic conditions has been appalling this is a dirty war men are taken back to the hospitals in incredible states of filth their stiffened clothing must frequently be cut off to reveal beneath vermin covered bodies when the problem of transportation is a serious one as after a great battle men must lie in sheds or railway stations waiting their turn wounds turn green and hideous their first aid dressing originally surgically clean becomes infected lucky the man who has had a small vial of iodine to pour over the gaping surface of his wound for the time at least he is well off the very soil of flanders seems polluted british surgeons are sighing for the clean dust of the boer war of south africa although they cursed it at the time that is not the army occupation which is causing the grave infections of flanders and france it is shown by the fact that the trouble dates from the beginning of the war it is not that living in a trench undermines the vitality of the men and lays them open to infection on the contrary with the exception of frostbite there is a curious absence of such troubles as would ordinarily result from exposure cold and constant wetting the open-air life has apparently built up the men again and again the extraordinary power of resistance shown has astonished the surgeons it is as if in forcing men to face overwhelming hardships a watchful providence had granted them overwhelming vitality 
perhaps the infection of the soil the typhoid carrying waters that seep through and into the trenches the tetanus and gangrene that may infect the simplest wounds are due to the long intense cultivation of that fertile country to the fertilization by organic matter of its fields doubtless the vermin that cover many of the troops form the connecting link between the soil and the infected men in many places gasoline is being delivered to the troopers to kill these pests and it is a german army joke that before a charge on a russian trench it is necessary to send ahead men to scatter insect powder so serious is the problem in the east indeed that an official order from berlin now requires all cards returning from russia to be placarded aus Ruslan, before using again thoroughly sterilize and unlouse and no upholstered cars are allowed to be used generally speaking a soldier is injured either in his trench or in front of it in the wasteland between the confronting armies in the latter case if the lines are close together the situation is still further complicated it may be and often is impossible to reach him at all he must lie there for hours or even for days of suffering until merciful death overtakes him when he can be rescued he is and many of the bravest deeds of this war have been acts of such salvage in addition to the work of the ambulance corps and of volunteer soldiers who often venture out into a rain of death to bring in fallen officers and comrades in the western field some five hundred ambulance dogs are being used by the allies to locate the wounded when a man is injured in the trenches his companions take care of him until night when it is possible to move him his first aid packet is opened a sterilized bandage produced and the dressing applied to the wound frequently has a small bottle of iodine and the wound is first painted with that in cases where iodine is used at once chances of infection are greatly lessened but often he must lie in the trench until night when the ambulances come up his comrades make him as comfortable as they can he lies on their overcoats his head frequently on his own pack fighting goes on about him above him other comrades fall in the trench and are carried and laid near him in the intervals of fighting men bring the injured men water for that is the first cry a great and insistent need water when they cannot get water from the canteens they drink what is in the bottom of the trench at last night falls the evening artillery duel except when a charge is anticipated is greatly lessened at night and infantry fire is only that of snipers but over the trench and over the line of communication behind the trench hang always the enemy's starlights the ambulances come up they cannot come as far as the trenches but stretchers are brought and the wounded men are lifted out as tenderly as possible many soldiers have tried to tell of the horrors of a night journey in an ambulance or transport careful driving is out of the question near the front the ambulance can have no lights and the roads everywhere have been torn up by shells men die in transit and dying hark back to early days they call for their mothers for their wives they dictate messages that no one can take down unloaded at railway stations the dead are separated from the living and piled in tiers on trucks the wounded lie about on stretchers on the station floor sometimes they are operated on there by the light of a candle it may be or of a smoking lamp when it is a well-equipped station there is the mercy of chloroform the blessed release of morphia but more times than i care to think of at night there has been no chloroform and no morphia france has sixty hospital trains england twelve belgium not so many i have seen trains drawing in with their burden of wounded men they travel slowly come to a gradual stop without jolting or jarring but instead of the rush of passengers to alight which usually follows the arrival of a train there is silence infinite quiet then somewhere a door is unhurriedly opened maybe a priest alights and looks about him perhaps it is a nurse who steps down and takes a comprehensive survey of conditions there is no talking no uproar a few men may come up to assist in lifting out the stretchers an ambulance driver who salutes and indicates with a gesture where his car is stationed there are no onlookers this is business the grim business of war the line of stretchers on the station platform grows the men lie on them impassive they have waited so long they have lain on the battlefield in the trench behind the line at the dressing shed waiting always waiting what is a little time more or less now the patients of the injured i have been in many hospitals i have seen pneumonia and typhoid patients lying in the fearful apathy of disease they are very sad to see very tragic 
but their patience is the lethargy of half-consciousness their fixed eyes see visions the patience of the wounded is the resignation of alert faculties once i saw a boy dying he was a dark-haired brown-eyed lad of eighteen he had a leg shattered the day before and he had lain for hours unattended on the battlefield the leg had been amputated and he was dying of loss of blood he lay alone in a small room of what had once been a girl's school he had asked to be propped up with pillows so that he could breathe his face was gray and only his eyes were alive they burned like coals he was alone the hospital was crowded and there were others who could be saved so he lay there propped high alone and as conscious as i am now and waited the nurse came back at last and his eyes greeted her there seemed to be nothing that i could do before his conscious eyes i was an intruder gazing at him in his extremity i went away and now and then when i hear this talk of national honor and am carried away with a hot flame of resentment so that i too would cry for war i seem to see that dying boy's eyes looking through the mist that are vengeance and hatred and affronted pride to war as it is the end of hope the gate of despair and agony and death after my return i received these letters the woman who wrote them will i know forgive me for publishing extracts from them she is a belgian married to an american more clearly than any words of mine they show where falls the burden of war i have just learned that my youngest brother has been killed in action in flanders king albert decorated him for conspicuous bravery on april twenty second and my poor boy went to his reward on april twenty sixth in my leaden heart through my whirling brain your words keep repeating themselves for king and country yes he died for them and died a hero i know only that his regiment the grenadiers was decimated my poor little boy god pity us all and save martyred belgium in a second letter i enclosed my dear little boy's obituary notice he died at the head of his company and five hundred and seventy-four of his grenadiers went down with him the regiment effectively checked the german advance and in recognition general Joffre pinned the cross of the legion of honor to his regimental colors but we are left to mourn though i do no begrudge my share of sorrow the pain is awful and i pray that by the grace of god you may never know what it means for king and country the only leaven in this black picture of war as have seen it as it has touched me has been the scarlet of the red cross to a faith that the terrible scene at the front had almost destroyed came every now and then again the flash of the emblem of mercy hope then was not dead there were hands to soothe and labor as well as hands to kill there was still brotherly love in the world there was a courage that was not of hate there was a patience that was not a lying in wait there was a flag that was not of one nation but of all the world a flag that needed no recruiting station for the ranks it led were always full to overflowing a flag that stood between the wounded soldier and death that knew no defeat but surrender to the will of the god of battles and that flag i followed to the front to the field hospitals behind the trenches to railway stations to hospital trains and ships to great base hospitals i watched its ambulances on shelled roads i followed its brassards as their rearers walking gently carried stretchers with their groaning burdens and whatever may have failed in this war treaties ammunition elaborate strategies even some of the humanities the red cross as a symbol of service has never failed i was a critical observer i am a graduate of a hospital training school and more or less for years i have been in touch with hospitals i myself was enrolled under the red cross banner i was prepared for efficiency what i was not prepared for was the absolute self-sacrifice the indifference to cost in effort in very life itself of a great army of men and women i saw english aristocrats scrubbing floors i found american surgeons working day and night under the very roar and rattle of guns i found cultured women of every nation performing the most menial tasks i found an army where all are equal priests surgeons scholars chauffeurs poets women of the stage young girls who until now have been shielded from the very name of death all enrolled under the red badge of mercy end of chapter thirty three
Chapter Thirty Four of Kings, Queens, and Pawns: An American Woman at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Kings, Queens, and Pawns: An American Woman at the Front by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Chapter Thirty Four: In Terms of Life and Death. One of the first hospitals I saw was in Calais. We entered a muddy courtyard through a gate, and the building loomed before us. It had been a girls' convent school, and was now a military hospital for both the French and British armies, one half the building being used by each. It was the first war hospital I had seen, and I was taken through the building by Major S. of the Royal Army Medical Corps. It was morning, and the corridors and stairs still bore the mud of the night. When the ambulances drive into the courtyard and the stretchers, are carried up the stairs it had been a rather a quiet night said major s the operations were already over and now the work of cleaning up was going on he opened a door and we entered a long ward i live in a great manufacturing city day by day its mills take their toll and crush bodies the sight of broken humanity is not new to me in a general way it is the price we pay for prosperity individually men so injured are the losers in life's great struggle for food and shelter I had never before seen men dying of an ideal. There is a terrible sameness in war hospitals. There are rows of beds, and in them rows of unshaven, white-faced men. Some of them turn and look at visitors. Others lie very still, with their eyes fixed on the ceiling, or eternity, or God knows what. Now and then, one is sleeping. He has slept since he came in, the nurse will say, utter exhaustion. Often they die. If there is a screen, the death takes place decently and in order away from the eyes of the ward but when there is no screen it makes little difference what is one death to men who have seen so many once men thought in terms of a day's work a night's sleep of labor and play and love but all over europe to-day in hospital and out men are learning to think in terms of life and death what will be the result a general brutalizing the loss of much that is fine perhaps there are some who think that it will scourge men's souls clean of pettiness teach them proportion give them a larger outlook but is it petty to labor and love is the duty of the nation greater than the duty of the home is the nation greater than the individual is the whole greater than the sum of its parts ward after ward rows of quiet men the occasional thump of a convalescent's crutch the swish of a nurse's starched dress the strangled grunt of a man as the dressing is removed from his wound the hiss of coal in the fireplace at the end of the ward perhaps a priest beside a bed or a nun over all the heavy odor of drugs and disinfectants brisk nurses go about cheery surgeons but there is no real cheer the ward is waiting i saw a man who had been shot in the lungs his lungs were filled with jagged pieces of steel he was inhaling oxygen from a tank there was an inhaler strapped over his mouth and nostrils and the oxygen passed through a bottle of water to moisten it before it entered his tortured lungs the water in the bottle seethed and bubbled and the man lay and waited he was waiting for the next breath above the mask his eyes were fixed intent would it come ah uh, that was not so bad almost a full breath that time but he must have another and another they are still all waiting for death maybe for home for health again or such travesty of health as may come for the hospital is not an end but a means it is an interval it is the connecting link between the trenches and home between war and peace between life and death that one hospital had been a school the children's laboratory is now the operating room there are rows of basins along one side set a trifle low for childish hands when i saw them they were faintly rimmed with red there was a locker room too once these lockers had held caps, no doubt, and overshoes, balls, and other treasures. Now they contain torn and stained uniforms, weapons, knapsacks. Does it matter how many wards there were, or how many surgeons? Do figures mean anything to us any more? When we read, in the spring of 1915, that the British Army, a small army compared with the others, had lost already in dead, wounded, and missing more than a quarter of a million men, we could not visualize it. Multiply one ward by infinity, one hospital by thousands, and then try to realize the terrible by-products of war. In that Calais hospital I saw for the first time the apparatus for removing bits of shell and shrapnel directly under the X-ray. 
four years ago such a procedure would have been considered not only marvelous but dangerous at that time in vienna and berlin i saw men with hands hopelessly burned and distorted as a result of merely taking photographic plates with the x-ray then came in lead glass screens screens of glass made with a lead percentage now as if science had prepared for this great emergency operators use gloves saturated with a lead solution and right-angled instruments and operate directly in the ray for cases where immediate extraction is inadvisable or unnecessary there is a stereoscopic arrangement of plates on the principle of our familiar stereoscope which shows the image with perspective and locates the foreign body exactly one plate i saw had a story attached to it i was stopping in a private house where a tall belgian doctor lived in the morning after breakfast i saw him carefully preparing a train carrying it upstairs there was a sick boy still in his teens up there as i passed the door i had seen him lying there gaunt and pale but plainly convalescent happening to go up shortly after i saw the tall surgeon by the side of the bed tray on his knees and later i heard the story the boy was his son during the winter he had been injured and taken prisoner the father in calais got word that his boy was badly injured and lying in a german hospital in belgium he was an only son i do not know how the frenzied father got into belgium perhaps he crept through the german lines he may have gone to sea and landed on the sand dunes near zeebrugge it does not matter now for he found his boy he went to the german authorities and got permission to move him to a private house the boy was badly hurt he had a bullet in the wall of the carotid artery for one thing and a fractured thigh the father saw that his recovery if it occurred at all would be a matter of skillful surgery and unremitting care but the father had a post at calais and was badly needed he took a wagon to the hospital and got his boy then he drove disguised i believe as a farmer over the frontier into holland the boy was covered in the bottom of the wagon in holland they got a boat and went to calais all this with that sharp pointed german bullet in the carotid artery and at calais they took the plate i have mentioned and got out the bullet the last time i saw that brave father he was sitting beside his son and the boy's hand was between both of his nearly all the hospitals i saw had been schools in one that i recall the gentle-faced nuns who by edict no longer exist in france were still living in a wing of the school building they had abandoned their quaint and beautiful habit for the ugly dress of the french provinces odd little bonnets that sat grotesquely on the tops of their heads stuffy black dresses black cotton gloves they would like to be useful but they belonged to an old regime under their bonnets their faces were placid but their eyes were sad their schoolrooms are hospital wards the tiny chapel is piled high with supplies in the refectory where decorous rows of small girls were wont to file into the convent meals unthinkable horrors of operations go on all day and far into the night the hall of the holy rosary is a convalescent room where soldiers smoke and play at cards the room of the holy angels contains a sterilizer through the corridors that once re-echoed to the soft padding of their felt shoes brisk english nurses pass with a rustle of skirts even the cross by which they lived has turned red the color of blood end of chapter thirty four Chapter 35 of Kings, Queens, and Pawns An American Woman at the Front This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Kings, Queens, and Pawns An American Woman at the Front Chapter 35 the losing game i saw a typhoid hospital in charge of two women doctors it was undermanned there were not enough nurses not enough orderlies one of the women physicians had served through the balkan war there was typhoid there she said but nothing to compare with this in malignancy nearly all the cases have come from one part of belgium some of the men were wounded in addition to the fever 
she told me that it was impossible to keep things in proper order with the help they had and food she said we cannot have eggs they are prohibitive at twenty-five centimes five cents each nor many broths meat is dear and scarce and there are no chickens we give them stewed macaroni and farinaceous things it's a terrible problem the charts bore out what she had said about the type of the disease they showed incredible temperatures with the sudden drop that is perforation or hemorrhage the odor was heavy men lay there far from home babbling in delirium or with fixed eyes picking at the bedclothes one was going to die that day others would last hardly longer they are all belgians here she said the british and french troops have been inoculated against typhoid so here again the belgians were playing a losing game perhaps they are being inoculated now i do not know to inoculate an army means much money and where is the belgian government to get it it seems the tragic irony of fate that the heroic little army should have been stationed in the infested territory are there any blows left to rain on belgium in a letter from the belgian lines the writer says this is just a race for life the point is which will get there first disease and sickness caused by drinking water unspeakably contaminated or sterilizing plants to avoid such a disaster another letter from a different writer also in belgium at the front says a friend of mine has just been invalided home with enteritis he had been drinking from a well with a dead frenchman in it the belgian soldiers fund in the spring of nineteen hundred fifteen sent out an appeal which said the full heat of summer will soon be upon the army and the dust of the battlefield will cause the men to suffer from an intolerable thirst this is a part of the appeal it is said that out of the twenty seven thousand men who gave their lives in the south african war seven thousand only were killed whilst twenty thousand died of enteritis contracted by drinking impure water in order to save their army from the fatal effects of contaminated water the belgian army medical authorities have after careful tests selected the following means of sterilization boiling ozone and violet rays as the most reliable methods for obtaining large supplies of pure water rapidly funds are urgently needed to help the work of providing and distributing a pure water supply in the following ways one by small portable sterilizing plants for every company to produce and distribute from twenty to a hundred gallons of pure cold water per hour two by sterilizers easy of adjustment for all field hospitals convalescent homes medical depots and so forth three by large sterilizing plants capable of producing from one hundred and fifty gallons upward per hour to provide a pure water supply for all the devastated towns through which the army must pass four by the sterilization of contaminated pools and all surface water under the direction of leading scientific experts who have generously offered their services five by pocket filters for all who may have to work out of reach of the sterilizing plants and so forth six by two hundred field kitchens on the battlefield to serve out soup coffee or other drinks to the men fighting in the trenches or on the march everywhere at the front i found the gravest apprehension as to water supply in case the confronting armies remained in approximately the same position sir john french spoke of it and the british are providing a system of sterilized water for their men merely providing so many human beings with water is a tremendous problem along part of the line quite aside from typhoid contamination the water is now impregnated with salt water from the sea if even wells contain dead bodies how about the open water courses wounded men must have water it is their first and most insistent cry people will read this who have never known the thirst of the battlefield or the parched throat that follows loss of blood people who by the turning of a tap may have all the water they want perhaps among them there are some who will face this problem of water 
as America has faced Belgium's problem of food. For the Belgian army has no money at all for sterilizers, for pocket filters, has not the means to inoculate the army against typhoid, has little of anything. The revenues that would normally support the army are being collected, in addition to a war indemnity, by Germany. Any hope that conditions would be improved by a general spring movement into uncontaminated territory has been dispelled. The war has become a gigantic siege, varied only by sorties and assaults. As long ago as November 1914, the situation as to drinking water was intolerable. I quote again from the diary taken from the body of a German officer after the Battle of the Isser, a diary published in full in an earlier chapter. The water is bad, quite green, indeed, but all the same we drink it. We can get nothing else. Man is brought down to the level of the brute beast. There is little or no typhoid among the British troops. They, too, no doubt, have realized the value of conservation, and to inoculation have added careful supervision of wells and of water courses. But when I was at the front, the Belgian army of 50,000 trained soldiers and 200,000 recruits was dependent on springs oozing from fields that were vast graveyards, on sluggish canals in which lay the bodies of men and horses, and on a few tank wagons that carried fresh water daily to the front. A quarter of a million dollars would be needed to install a water supply for the Belgian army and for the civilians, residents and refugees, gathered behind the lines. To ask the American people to shoulder this additional burden is out of the question. But perhaps, somewhere among the people who will read this, there is one great-hearted and wealthy American who would sleep better of nights for having lifted to the lips of a wounded soldier the cup of pure water that he craves, for having furnished to ten thousand wounds a sterile and soothing wet compress. Dunkirk was full of hospitals when I was there. Probably the subsequent shelling of the town destroyed some of them. I do not know. A letter from Calais, dated May 21st, 1915, says, I went through Dunkirk again. Last time I was there, it was a flourishing and busy market day. This time, the only two living souls I saw were the soldiers who let us in at one gate and out at the other. In the interval, as you know, the town had been shelled by 15-inch guns from a distance of 23 miles. Many buildings in the main streets had been reduced to ruins, and nearly all the windows in the town had been smashed. There is, or was, a converted channel steamer at Dunkirk that is now a hospital. Men in all stages of mutilation are there. The salt winds of the channel blow in through the open ports. The boat rises and falls to the swell of the sea. The deck cabins are occupied by wounded officers, and below, in the long saloon, are rows of cots. I went there on a bright day in February. There was a young officer on the deck. He had lost a leg at the hip, and he was standing, supported by a crutch, and looking out to sea. He did not even turn his head when we approached. General M., the head of the Belgian Army Medical Service, who had escorted me, touched him on the arm, and he looked round without interest. For conspicuous bravery, said the general, and showed me the medal he wore on his breast. However, the young officer's face did not lighten, and very soon he turned again to the sea. The time will come, of course, when the tragedy of his mutilation will be less fresh and poignant, when the order of Leopold on his breast will help to compensate for many things. But that sunny morning, on the deck of the hospital ship, it held small comfort for him. We went below. At our appearance at the top of the stairs, those who were convalescent below rose and stood at attention. They stood in a line at the foot of their beds, boys and grizzled veterans clad in motley garments, supported by crutches, by sticks, by a hand on the supporting back of a chair. Men without a country, where were they to go when the hospital ship had finished with them? Those who were able would go back to the army, of course. But what of that large percentage who will never be whole again? The machinery of mercy can go so far and no farther. France cannot support them. 
occupied with her own burden she has persistently discouraged belgian refugees they will go to england probably a kindly land but of an alien tongue and there again they will wait the waiting of the hospital will become the waiting of the refugee the channel coast towns of england are full of human derelicts who stand or sit for hours looking wistfully back toward what was once home the story of the hospitals is not always gloomy where the surroundings are favorable defeat is sometimes turned to victory tetanus is being fought and conquered by means of a serum the open treatment of fractures that is by cutting down and exposing the jagged edges of splintered bones and then uniting them has saved many a limb conservation is the watchword of the new surgery to save whenever possible the ruthless cutting and hacking of previous wars is a thing of the past i remember a boy in a french hospital whose leg bones had been fairly shattered eight pieces the surgeon said there had been two linear incisions connected by a center one like a letter h had been made the boy showed me the leg himself and a mighty proud and happy youngster he was there was no vestige of deformity no shortening the incisions had healed by first intention and the thin white lines of the h were all that told the story as if to offset the cheer of that recovery a man in the next bed was dying of an abdominal injury i saw the wound may the mother who bore him the wife he loved never dream of that wound i have told of the use of railway stations as temporary resting places for injured soldiers one is typical of them all as my visit was made during a lull in the fighting conditions were more than usually favorable there was no congestion on a bright afternoon early in march i went to the railway station three miles behind the trenches at e only a mile away a town was being shelled one could look across the fields at the changing roof line at a church steeple that had so far escaped but no shells were falling in e the station was a small village one in the room corresponding to our baggage room straw had been spread over the floor and men just out of the trenches lay there in every attitude of exhaustion in a tiny room just beyond two or three women were making soup as fast as one kettle was ready it was served to the hungry men there were several kettles all the small stove would hold soup was there in every state from the finished product to the raw meat and vegetables on a table beyond was a waiting room with benches here were slightly injured men bandaged but able to walk about a few slept on the benches heads lolled back against the whitewashed wall the others were paying no attention to the incessant nearby firing but were watching a boy who was drawing he had a supply of colored crayons and the walls as high as he could reach were almost covered there were priests soldier types caricatures of the german emperor the arms of france and belgium i do not remember what all and it was exceedingly well done the boy was an artist to his fingertips at a clever caricature of the german emperor the soldiers laughed and clapped their hands while they were laughing i looked through an open door three men lay on cots in an inner room rather two men and a boy i went in one of the men was shot through the spine and paralyzed the second one had a bullet in his neck and his face already bore the dark flush and anxious look of general infection the boy smiled they had been there since the day before waiting for a locomotive to come and move the hospital train that waited outside in that railway station the boy had had his leg taken off at the knee they lay there quite alone the few women were feeding starving men now and then one would look in to see if there was any change there was nothing to be done they lay there and the shells burst incessantly a mile away and the men in the next room laughed and applauded at some happy stroke of the young artist i am so sorry i said to the boy the others had not roused at my entrance, but he had looked at me with quick, intelligent eyes. It is nothing, was his reply. Outside in the village, soldiers thronged the streets. The sun was shining with the first promise of spring. In an area away, regimental butchering was going on, and a great sow, escaping, ran frenzied down the street, followed by a throng of laughing, shouting men. 
and still the shells fell across a few fields and inside the station the three men lay and waited that evening at dusk the bombardment ceased and i went through the shelled town it was difficult to get about walls had fallen across the way interiors that had been homes gaped open to the streets shattered beds and furnishings lay about kitchen utensils broken dishes on some of the walls holy pictures still hung grouped about a crucifix there are many to tell how the crucifix has escaped in the wholesale destruction of towns a shoemaker had come back into the village for the night and had opened his shop for a time he seemed to be the only inhabitant of what i had known a short time before as a prosperous and thriving market town then through an aperture that had been a window i saw three women sitting round a candle and in the next street i found a man on his knees on the pavement working with bricks and a trowel he explained that he had closed up a small cellar way his family had no place else to go and were coming in from the fields where they had sought safety to sleep in the cellar for the night he was leaving a small aperture to be closed with bags of sand so that if the house was destroyed over them in the night they could crawl out and escape he knelt on the bricks in front of the house a patient resigned figure playing no politics interested not at all in war and diplomacy in a way to the sea or to a place in the sun one of the millions who must adapt themselves to new and fearsome situations and do their best that night sitting at dinner in a hotel i saw two pretty nurses come in they had been relieved for a few hours from their hospital and were on holiday one of them had a clear although musical voice what she said came to me with great distinctness and what she was wishing for was a glass of american soda water now long months before i had had any idea of going to the war i had read an american correspondent's story of the evacuation of antwerp and of a tall young american girl a nurse whom the others called morning glory he never knew the rest of her name anyhow morning glory leaped into my mind and stayed there through soup through rabbit which was called on the menu something entirely different through hard cakes and a withered orange so when a young lieutenant asked permission to bring them over to meet me i was eager it was morning glory her name is really glory and she is a southern girl somewhere among my papers i have a snapshot of her helping to take a wounded soldier out of an ambulance and if the correspondent wants it i shall send it to him also her name which he never knew and i will verify his opinion that it is better to be a morning glory in flanders than to be a good many other things that i can think of end of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six of kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Kings, Queens, and Pawns, An American Woman at the Front, by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Chapter 36. How Americans Can Help. With the possible exception of Germany, which seems to have anticipated everything, no one of the nations engaged appears to have expected the fearful carnage of this war. The destructive effect of the modern, high-explosive shell has been well known, but it is the trench form of warfare which, by keeping troops in stationary positions under grilling artillery fire, has given such shells their opportunity. Shrapnel has not been so deadly to the men in the trenches." The result of the vast casualty lists has been some hundreds of isolated hospitals scattered through France, not affiliated with any of the Red Cross societies. Unorganized, poverty-stricken, frequently having only the services of a surgeon who can come but once a week. They have no dressings, no nurses save peasants, no bedding, no coal to cook even the scanty food that the villagers can spare. No coal for france is facing a coal famine to-day her coal mines are in the territory held by the germans 
even if she had the mines where would she get men to labor in them or trains to transport the coal there are more than three hundred such hospitals scattered through isolated french villages hospitals where everything is needed for whatever else held fast during the first year of the war the nursing system of france absolutely failed some six hundred miles of hospital wards there are today in france with cots so close together that one can hardly step between it is true that with the passing of time the first chaos is giving way to order but france unlike england has the enemy within her boundaries on her soil her every resource is taxed and the need is still great the story of the town of d in Brittany is very typical of what the war has brought into many isolated communities d is a little town of two thousand inhabitants with a thirteenth-century church with medieval houses with quaint stone porticos and outside staircases there is one street shaped like a sickle with a handle that is the station road war was declared and the men of d went away the women and children brought in the harvest and waited for news what little came was discouraging one day in august one of the rare trains stopped at the station and an inspector got off and walked up the sickle handle to the schoolhouse he looked about and made the comment that it would hold eighty beds whereupon he went away and d waited for news and gathered the harvest on the fifth of september nineteen hundred fourteen the terrific battle of the marne commenced the french strategic retreat was at an end and with her allies france resumed the offensive what happened in the little village of d and remember that d is only one of hundreds of tiny interior towns d has never heard of the red cross but d venerated in its thirteenth century church the cross of christ this is what happened one day in the first week of september a train drew up at the box-like station a heterogeneous train coaches luggage vans cattle and horse cars the doors opened and the work of emptying the cars began the women and children aghast and bewildered ran down the sickle handle road and watched four hundred wounded men were taken out of the cars laid prone on the station platform and the train went on there were no surgeons in d but there was a chemist who knew something of medicine and who for one reason or another had not been called to the ranks there were no horses to draw carts there was nothing the chemist was a man of action very soon the sickle and the old church saw a curious sight they saw women and children a procession pushing wounded men to the school in the hand carts that country people use for milk cans and produce they saw brawny peasant women carrying chairs in which sat injured men with lolling heads and sunken eyes bales of straw were brought into the school tender if unaccustomed hands washed fearful wounds but there were no dressings no bandages any one who knows the french peasant and his poverty will realize the plight of the little town the peasant has no reserves of supplies life is reduced to its simplest elements there is nothing that is not in use d solved part of its problem by giving up its own wooden beds to the soldiers it tore up its small stock of linen its towels its dusters but the problem of food remained there was a tiny stove on which the three or four teachers of the school had been accustomed to cook their midday meal there was no coal only wood and green wood at that all day and all day now d cooks the pot au feu for the wounded on that tiny stove pot au feu is good diet for convalescents but the light diets must have eggs broth whatever can be found so the peasant woman of d comes to the hospital bringing a few eggs the midday meal of her family who will do without i have spoken mainly in the past tense but conditions in d are not greatly changed to-day an old marquise impoverished by the war darns the pathetic socks of the wounded men and mends their uniforms at the last report i received the corridors and schoolrooms were still filled every inch of space with a motley collection of beds on which men lay in their uniforms for lack of other clothing 
they were covered with old patchwork quilts with anything that can be used there were of course no sheets all the sheets were used long ago for dressings a friend of mine there recently saw a soldier with one leg in the kitchen rolling wretched scraps and dusters for bandages there was no way to sterilize them of course once a week a surgeon comes when he goes away he takes his instruments with him this is not an isolated case nor an exaggerated one there are things i do not care to publish three hundred and more such hospitals are known the french government pays or will pay twenty-five cents a day to keep these men black bread and pot au feu is all that can be managed on that amount convalescents sit up in bed and painfully unravel their tattered socks for wool they tie the bits together often two or three inches in length and knit new feet in old socks or when they secure enough new socks for the germans hold the wool cities of france ordinarily worsted costs eighteen and nineteen francs in dinard and st malo or from three dollars and sixty cents to three dollars and eighty cents a pound much of the government reserves of woolen underwear for the soldiers was in the captured towns and german prisoners have been found wearing woolens with the french government stamp every sort of building is being used for these isolated hospitals garages town halls private dwellings schools at first they had no chloroform no instruments there are cases on record where automobile tools were used in emergency kitchen knives saws anything in one case last spring two hundred convalescents leaving one of these hospitals on a cold day in march were called back on the arrival of a hundred freshly wounded men that every superfluous bandage on their wounds might be removed to be used again naturally depending entirely on the unskilled nursing of the village women much that we regard as fundamental in hospital practice is ignored wounded men typhoid and scarlet fever cases are found in the same wards in one isolated town a single clinical thermometer is obliged to serve for sixty typhoid and scarlet fever patients note f footnote f written in june nineteen hundred fifteen sometimes the men in these isolated and ill-equipped refuges realize the horror and hopelessness of their situation the nights are particularly bad any one who knows hospitals well knows the night terrors of the wards knows too the contagion of excitement that proceeds from a hysterical or delirious patient in some of these lonely hospitals hell breaks loose at night the peasant women must sleep even the tireless nuns cannot labor forever without rest the men have come from battlefields of infinite horror a frenzied dream a delirious soldier calling them to the charge and panic rages to offset these horrors of the night the peasants have here and there resorted to music it is naive pathetic where there is a piano it is moved into the school or garage or whatever the building may be and at twilight a nun or a volunteer musician plays quietly to soothe the men to sleep in one or two towns a village band or perhaps a lone cornetist plays in the street outside so the days go on and the nights supplies are begged for and do not always come dressings are washed to be used again and again an attempt is now being made to better these conditions a frenchwoman helping in one of these hospitals and driven almost to madness by the outcries of men and boys undergoing operations without anesthetics found her appeals for help unanswered she decided to go to england to ask her friends there for chloroform and to take it back on the next boat she was successful she carried back with her on numerous journeys dressings chloroform cotton even a few instruments she is still doing this work others interested in isolated hospitals hearing of her success appealed to her and now regular if small shipments of chloroform and dressings are going across the channel americans willing to take their own cars and willing to work will find plenty to do in distributing such supplies over there 
a request has come to me to find such americans surgeons who can spare a scalpel an artery clip or two ligatures catgut or silk and forceps may be certain of having them used at once bandages rolled by kindly american hands will not lie unclaimed on the quay at havre or calais so many things about these little hospitals of france are touching without having any particular connection there was a surgeon in one of these isolated villages with an x-ray machine but no gloves or lead screen to protect himself he worked on using the deadly rays to locate pieces of shell bullets and shrapnel and knowing all the time what would happen he has lost both hands since my return to america the problems of those who care for the sick and wounded have been further complicated among the allies by the inhuman use of asphyxiating gases sir john french says of these gases the effect of this poison is not merely disabling or even painlessly fatal as suggested in the german press those of its victims who do not succumb on the field and who can be brought into hospitals suffer acutely and in a large proportion of cases die a painful and lingering death those who survive are in little better case as the injury to their lungs appears to be of a permanent character and reduces them to a condition that points to their being invalids for life i have received from the front one of the respirators given out to the troops to be used when the gas clouds appear it is prepared with hypophosphite of soda wrote the surgeon who sent it and all they have to do before putting it on is to dip it in the water in the trenches they are all supplied in addition with goggles which are worn on their caps this is from the same letter that night a german soldier was brought in wounded and jolly glad he was to be taken he told us he had been turned down three times for pathesis tuberculosis and then in the end was called up and put into the trenches after eight weeks training all of which is very significant another wounded german told the men at the ambulance that they must move on as soon as they could as very soon the germans would be in calais all the german soldiers write home now on the official cards which have calais printed on the top of them not all i have before me a card from a german officer in the trenches in france it is a good-natured bit of raillery with something of grimness underneath dear madame i nibble them joffre see your article in the saturday evening post of may twenty ninth nineteen hundred fifteen really joffre has had time it is september now and we are not nibbled yet still we stand deep in france au revoir à paris madame he signs it yours truly and then his name not calais then but paris end of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front by mary roberts reinhardt chapter thirty seven an army of children it is undeniably true that the humanities are failing us as the war goes on not thank god the broad humanity of the red cross but that individual compassion of a man for his wounded brother of which the very fabric of mercy is woven there is too much death too much suffering men grow calloused as yet the loss is not irretrievable but the war is still only a matter of months what if it is to be of years france and belgium were suffering from a wave of atheism before the war but there comes a time in the existence of nations as in the lives of individuals when human endeavor seems useless when the world and the things thereof have failed at such time nations and individuals alike turn at last to a higher power france is on her knees to-day her churches are crowded 
not perhaps since the days of chivalry when men were shriven in the churches before going out to battle has france so generally knelt and bowed her head but it is to the god of battles that she prays on her battlefields the priests have most signally distinguished themselves some have exchanged the soutan for the uniform and have fought bravely and well others like the priests who stood firm in the midst of jordan have carried their message of hope to the dying into the trenches no article on the work of the red cross can be complete without a reference to the work of these priests not perhaps affiliated with the society but doing yeoman work of service among the wounded they are everywhere in the trenches or at the outposts in the hospitals and hospital trains in hundreds of small villages where the entire community plus its burden of wounded turns to the cure for everything from advice to the sacrament in prostrate belgium the demands on the priests have been extremely heavy subjected to insult injury and even death during the german invasion where in one diocese alone thirteen were put to death their churches destroyed or used as barracks by the enemy that which was their world has turned to chaos about them those who remained with their conquered people have done their best to keep their small communities together and to look after their material needs which has indeed been the lot of the priests of battle-scarred flanders for many generations others have attached themselves to the hospital service all the belgian trains of wounded are cared for solely by these priests who perform every necessary service for their men and who as i have said before administer the sacrament and make coffee to cheer the flagging spirits of the wounded with equal courage and resource surgeons nurses priests nuns volunteer workers who substitute for lack of training both courage and zeal these are a part of the machinery of mercy there is another element the boy scouts during the early days of the war the boy scouts of england then on school holiday did marvelous work boys of fourteen made repeated trips across the channel bringing back from france children invalids timorous women they volunteered in the hospitals ran errands carried messages were as useful as only willing boys can be they did scout service too guarding the railway lines and assisting in watching the channel coast but with the end of the holiday most of the english boy scouts were obliged to go back to school their activities were not over but they were largely curtailed there were five thousand boy scouts in belgium at the beginning of the war i saw them everywhere behind the battle lines on the driving seats of ambulances at the doors of hospitals they were very calm because i know a good deal about small boys i smothered a riotous impulse to hug them and spoke to them as grown-up to grown-up thus approached they met my advances with dignity but without excitement and after a time i learned something about them from the chief scout of belgium perhaps it will show the boy scouts of america what they will mean to the country in time of war perhaps it will make them realize that being a scout is not after all only camping in the woods long hikes games in the open the long hikes fit a boy for dispatch carrying the camping teaches him to care for himself when if necessity arises he is thrown on the country like his older brother the fighting man a small cog perhaps in the machinery of mercy but a necessary one a vital cog in the vast machinery of war that is the boy scout today the day after the declaration of war the belgian scouts were mobilized by order of the minister of war five thousand boys then ranging in age from twelve to eighteen an army of children what a sight they must have been how many grown-ups can think of it with dry eyes what a terrible emergency was this which must call the children into battle they were placed at the service of the military authorities to do any and every kind of work some with ordinary bicycles or motorcycles were made dispatch riders the senior scouts were enlisted in the regular army armed and they joined the soldiers in barracks the younger boys between thirteen and sixteen were letter carriers messengers in the different ministries 
or orderlies in the hospitals that were immediately organized those who could drive automobiles were given that to do others of the older boys having been well trained in scouting were set to watch points of importance or given carbines and attached to the civic guard during the siege of liege between forty and fifty boy scouts were constantly employed carrying food and ammunition to the beleaguered troops the germans finally realized that every boy scout was a potential spy working for his country the uniform itself then became a menace since boys wearing it were frequently shot the boys abandoned it the older ones assuming the belgian uniform and the younger ones returning to civilian dress but although in the chaos that followed the invasion and particularly the fall of liege they were virtually disbanded they continued their work as spies as dispatch riders as stretcher bearers there are still nine boy scouts with the famous ninth regiment which has been decorated by the king one boy scout captured single-handed two german officers somewhere or other he had got a revolver and with it was patrolling a road the officers were lost and searching for their regiments as they stepped out of a wood the boy confronted them with his revolver leveled this happened near liege trust a boy to use his wits in emergency here is another lad aged fifteen who found himself in liege after its surrender and who wanted to get back to the belgian army he offered his services as stretcher bearer in the german army and was given a german red cross pass armed with this pass he left liege passed successfully many centuries and at last got to antwerp by a circuitous route on the way he found a dead german and being only a small boy after all he took off the dead man's stained uniform and bore it in his arms into antwerp there is no use explaining about that uniform if you do not know boys you will never understand if you do it requires no explanation here is a fourteen-year-old lad entrusted with a message of the utmost importance for military headquarters in antwerp he left brussels in civilian clothing but he had neglected to take off his boy scout shirt boy fashion the germans captured him and stripped him and they burned the boy scout shirt then they locked him up but they did not find his message all day he lay in duress and part of the night perhaps he shed a few tears he was very young and things looked black for him boy scouts were being shot remember but it never occurred to him to destroy the message that meant his death if discovered he was clever with locks and such things after the manner of boys and for most of the night he worked with the window and shutter lock perhaps he had a nail in his pocket or some wire most boys have and just before dawn he got window and shutter opened and dropped a long drop to the ground he lay there for a while getting his breath and listening then on his stomach he slid away into the darkest hour that is just before the dawn later on that day a footsore and weary but triumphant youngster presented himself at the headquarters of the belgian army in antwerp and insisted on seeing the minister of war being at last admitted he turned up a very travel-stained and weary little boy's foot and proceeded to strip a piece of adhesive plaster from the sole underneath the plaster was the message war is a thing of fearful and curious anomalies it is shown that humane units may comprise a brutal whole that civilization is a shirt over a coat of mail it is shown that hatred and love are kindred emotions boon companions friends it is shown that in every man there are two men devil and saint that there are two courages that of the mind which is bravest that of the heart which is greatest it is shown that government by men only is not an appeal to reason but an appeal to arms that on women without a voice to protest must fall the burden it is easier to die than to send a son to death it has shown that a single hatred may infect a world but it has shown that mercy too may spread among nations that love is greater than cannon greater than hate greater than vengeance that it triumphs over wrath as good triumphs over evil direct descendant of the cross of the christian faith the red cross carries on to every battlefield the words of the man of mercy blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy 
on a day in march i went back to england march in england is spring masses of snowdrops line the paths in hyde park the grass was green the roads hard and dry under the eager feet of kitchener's great army they marched gaily by the drums beat the passers-by stopped here and there an open carriage or an automobile drew up and pale men some of them still in bandages sat and watched in their eyes was the same flaming eagerness the same impatience to get back to be loosed against the old lion's foes all through england all through france all through the tragic corner of belgium that remains to her were similar armies drilling and waiting equally young equally eager equally resolute and the thing that they were going to i knew i had seen it in that mysterious region that had swallowed up those who had gone before in the trenches in the operating rooms of field hospitals at outposts where the sentries walked hand in hand with death war is not two great armies meeting in the clash and frenzy of battle war is a boy carried on a stretcher looking up at god's blue sky with bewildered eyes that are soon to close war is a woman carrying a child that has been injured by a shell war is spirited horses tied in burning buildings and waiting for death war is the flower of a race battered hungry bleeding up to its knees in filthy water war is an old woman burning a candle before the mater dolorosa for the son she has given for king and country end of kings queens and pawns an american woman at the front